Part 1 of Ancient Greek Philosophers Scientists. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt. Ancient Greek Philosopher Scientists, a collection of their surviving words, reported in ancient sources and translated by various translators. Part 1. Fragments of Anaxagoras of Clazomenae, translated by John Burnett in Early Greek Philosophy, 3rd edition. 1. All things were together, intimate both in number and in smallness for the small, too, was infinite. And, when all things were together, none of them could be distinguished for their smallness. For air and ether prevailed over all things, being both of them infinite. For amongst all things, these are the greatest, both in quantity and size. 2. For air and ether are separated off from the mass that surrounds the world, and the surrounding mass is infinite in quantity. 3. Nor is there a least of what is small, but there is always a smaller. For it cannot be what is should cease to be by being cut, but there is also always something greater than what is great, and it is equal to the small in amount and compared with itself, each thing is both great and small. 4. And since these things are so, we must suppose that there are contained many things, and all sorts in the things that are uniting, seeds of all things, with all sorts of shapes and colors and savors, and that men have been formed in them, and the other animals that have life, and that these men have inhabited cities and cultivated fields as with us, and that they have a sun and a moon, and the rest is with us, and that their earth brings forth for them many things of all kinds, of which they gather the best together into their dwellings and use them. Thus much have I said with regard to separating off, to show that it will not only be with us that things are separated off, but elsewhere too. But before they were separated off, when all things were together, not even was any color distinguishable, for the mixture of all things prevented it. Of the moist and the dry, and the warm and the cold, and the light and the dark, and of much earth that was in it, and a multitude of innumerable seeds in no way like each other. For none of the other things either is like any other, and these things being so, we must hold that all things are in the whole. 5. And those things have been thus decided. We must know that all of them are neither more nor less, for it is not possible for them to be more than all, and all are always equal. 6. And since the portions of the great and of the small are equal in amount, for this reason, too, all things will be in everything. Nor is it possible for them to be apart, but all things have a portion of everything. Since it is impossible for there to be a least thing, they cannot be separated, nor come to be by themselves. But they must be now, just as they were in the beginning, all together. And in all things, many things are contained, and an equal number both in the greater and in the smaller of the things that are separated off. 7 so that we cannot know the number of things that are separated off, either in word or deed. 8. And the things that are in one world are not divided nor cut off from one another with a hatchet, neither the warm from the cold, nor the cold from the warm. 9. 
as these things revolve and are separated off by the force and swiftness and the swiftness makes the force their swiftness is not like the swiftness of any of the things that are now among men but in every way many times as swift ten how can hair come from what is not hair or flesh from what is not flesh eleven in everything there is a portion of everything except noose and there are some things in which there is noose also twelve all other things partake in a portion of everything while noose is infinite and self-ruled and is mixed with nothing but is alone itself by itself for if it were not by itself but were mixed with anything else it would partake in all things if it were mixed with any for in everything there is a portion of everything as has been said by me in what goes before and the things mixed with it would hinder it so that it would have power over nothing in the same way it has now being alone by itself for it is the thinnest of all things and the purest and it has all knowledge about everything and the greatest strength and noose has power over all things both greater and smaller that have life and noose has power over the whole revolution so that it began to revolve in the beginning and it began to revolve first from a small beginning but the revolution now extends over a large space and will extend over a larger still and all things that are mingled together and separated off and distinguished are all known by noose and noose set in order all things that were to be and all things that were and are not now and that are and this revolution in which now revolve the stars and the sun and the moon and the air and the ether that are separated off and this revolution causes the separating off and the rare is separated from the dense and the warm from the cold and the light from the dark and the dry from the moist and there are many portions in many things but no thing is altogether separated off nor distinguished from anything else except noose and all noose is alike both the greater and the smaller while nothing else is like anything else but each single thing is and was most manifestly those things of which it has most in it thirteen and when noose began to move things separating off took place from all that was moved and so much as noose set in motion was separated and as things were set in motion and separated the revolution caused them to be separated much more fourteen and noose whichever is is certainly there where everything else is in the surrounding mass and in what has been united with it and separated off from it 15 the dense and the moist and the cold and the dark came together where the earth is now while the rare and the warm and the dry and the bright went out toward the further parts of the ether 16 from these as they are separated off earth is solidified for from mist water is separated off and from water earth from the earth stones are solidified by the cold and these rush outwards more than water 17 the hellenes follow a wrong usage in speaking of coming into being and passing away for nothing comes into being or passes away but there's a mingling and separation of things that are so they would be right to call coming into being mixture and passing away separation 18 
It is the sun that puts brightness onto the moon. 19. We call rainbow the reflection of the sun in the clouds. Now it is a sign of storm, for the water that flows round the cloud causes wind and pours down in rain. 20. With the rise of the dog star, men begin to harvest. With its setting, they begin to till the fields. It is hidden for forty days and nights. 21. From the weakness of our senses, we are not able to judge truth. 21a. What appears is a vision of the unseen. 21b. We can make use of the lower animals because we use our own experience and memory and wisdom and art. 22. What is called bird's milk is the white of the egg. End of part one. Recording by Matt. Part two of Ancient Greek Philosopher Scientists. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by 7. Ancient Greek Philosopher Scientists A collection of their surviving words reported in ancient sources and translated by various translators. Testimonials on Anaximander of Miliotis Translated by John Burnett in Early Greek Philosophy, 3rd edition. Theoprastus, Physics, Fragment 2 Aniaximander of Meliotis, son of Praxiadius, a fellow citizen and associate of Thales, said that the material cause and first element of things was the infinite, he being the first to introduce this name for the material cause. He says it is neither water nor any other of the so-called elements, but a substance different from them which is infinite, from which arise all the heavens and the worlds within them, and into that from which things they take their rise they pass away once more as is ordained, for they make reparation and satisfaction to one another for their injustice according to the appointed time, as he says in these somewhat poetical terms. pseudo Plutriac, Stromatius, Fragment 2. He says that the earth is cylindrical in form, and that its depth is a third of its breadth. He says that something capable of begetting hot and cold was separated off from the eternal at the origin of this world. From this arose a sphere of flame which grew round the air encircling the earth, as the bark grows round a tree. When this was torn off and enclosed in certain things, the sun, moon, and stars came into existence. Hippolytus, Refutation of All Heresies, 1.6 He says that this is eternal and ageless, and that it encompasses all the worlds, and besides this there was an eternal motion in the course of which was brought about the origin of the worlds. The earth swings free, held in its place by nothing, it stays where it is because of its equal distance from everything. Its shape is convex and round and like a stone pillar. We are on one of the surfaces, and the other is on the opposite side. The heavenly bodies are wheels of fire separated off from the fire which encircles the world and enclosed in air, and they have breathing holes, certain pipe-like passages at which the heavenly bodies are seen. For this reason, too, when the breathing holes are stopped, eclipses occur. And the moon appears now to wax and now to wane because of the stopping and opening of the passages. The circle of the sun is twenty-seven times the size of the earth, while that of the moon is eighteen times as large. The sun is highest of all, and the lowest are the wheels of the fixed stars. Living creatures arose from the moist elements as it was evaporated by the sun. Man was like another animal, namely a fish, in the beginning. Hippolytus, Refutation of All Heresies, 1.6,7 Rain was produced by the moisture drawn up from the earth by the sun. Aristotle, Physics 3, 5, 204b, 22. Further, there cannot be a single body which is infinite, either, as some hold, one distinct from the elements, which they then derive from it, nor without this qualification. For there are some who make this, i.e., a body distinct from other elements, the infinite and not air or water, in order that the other things may not be destroyed by their infinity. They are in opposition one to another. Air is cold, water moist, and fire hot. And therefore, if any one of them were infinite, the rest would have ceased to be by this time. 
Accordingly, they say that infinite is something other than the elements, and from its elements arise. Atius, Placita Philosophorum, 2.13,7, semicolon 15,6. Aniax Manda said that the stars were hoop-like compressions of air full of fire, breathing out flames at certain point from orifices. The sun was highest of all. After that came the moon, and below these, the fixed stars and the planets. 20.21 Aniax Manda said that the sun was a ring 28 times the size of the earth, like a cartwheel with a fellow hollow, and full of fire, showing the fire at a certain point as if through the nozzle of a pair of bellows. 2.211. Aniex Manda said that the sun was equal to the earth, but the ring from which it breathes out and by which it is carried round was 27 times as large as the earth. 20.25,1. Aniex Manda said that the moon was a ring 18 times the size of the earth. 3.3,1. Aniex Manda held that the thunder and lightning were caused by the blast, when it was shut up in a thick cloud and burst forth with violence. Then the breakage of the clouds makes the noise, and the rift gives the appearance of a flash by contrast with the darkness of the cloud. 3.6,1 An Manda held that the wind was a current of air, i.e. vapor, which arose when its finest and moistest particles were set in motion or dissolved by the sun. 3.16,1 The sea is what is left of the original moisture. The fire has dried up most of it and turned the rest salt by scorching it. 5.19,1 the first animals were produced in the moisture, each enclosed in a prickly bark. As they advanced in age, they came out upon the drier part. When the bark broke off, they survived for a short time. Plutarac, Symposiax, 730F. He declares that first, human beings arose in the inside of fishes, and after having been reared like sharks and become capable of protecting themselves, they were finally cast ashore and took to land. Cicero, On the Nature of Gods, 1.10. It was the opinion of Anaximander that gods have a beginning, at long intervals rising and setting, and that they are the innumerable worlds. But who of us can think of God except as immortal? End of part two. Recording by seven. Part three of Ancient Greek Philosopher Scientists. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Seven. Ancient Greek Philosopher of Scientists. A collection of their surviving words reported in ancient sources and translated by various translators. Part 3. Fragmented Testimonials on Anaximenes of Meletos. Translated by Arthur Fairbanks in The First Philosophers of Greece. Fragment of Anaximenes of Meletos. Air is the nearest to an immaterial thing, for since we are generated in the flow of air, it is necessary that it should be infinite and abundant, because it is never exhausted. Testimonials on Anaximenes of Melitos Aristotle Meteorology 2.1 Most of the earlier students of the heavenly bodies believed that the sun did not go underneath the earth, but rather round the earth, and this region and treated it disappeared from view and produced night because the earth was so high toward the north. Simplicius, comments on Aristotle's On the Heavens, 273b, 45. He regarded the first principle as unlimited, but not as undefined, for he called it air, thinking that air had a sufficient adaptability to change. Simplicius, comments on Aristotle's Physics, 32r, 149, 32. Of this one writer alone, Theoprastos, in his account of the physicists, uses the words Greek of texture. The rest, of course, spoke of Greek. Simplicius comments on Aristotle's physics, 2,57v. Some say that the universe always existed, not that it has always been the same, but rather it successively changes its character in certain periods of time, as, for instance, Anaximenes and Heracles and Diogenes. Aristotle on the heavens, 2.13, 294b13. Anaximenes, Anaxagoras, and Democritus say that the breadth of the earth is the reason why it remains where it is. Aristotle, Meteorology, 2.7, 365. Anaximenes says that the earth was wet, 
and when it dried it broke out, and that the earthquakes are due to the breaking and falling of hills. Accordingly, earthquakes occur in droughts, and in rainy seasons also. They occur in drought, as has been said, because the earth dries and breaks apart, and it also crumbles when it is wet through with waters. Aristotle, Metaphysics, 1.3, 984-5. Anaximenes regarded air as the first principle. Plutarch, on the principle of cold, 7.3. According to Anaximenes, the early philosopher, we should not neglect either cold or heat in being, but should regard them as common experiences of matter which are incident to its changes. He says that the compressed and the condensed state of matter is cold, while the rarefied and relaxed, a word he himself uses, state of it is heat. Whence he says, it is not strange that men breathe hot and cold out of the mouth, for the breath is cooled as it is compressed and condensed by the lips, but when the mouth is relaxed, it comes out warm by reason of its rarefaction. Theoprastus, Physics, 6R, 24,26. Anaximenes of Miletus, son of Eurostratus, a companion of Anaximander, agrees with him that the essential nature of things is one and infinite. But he regards it not as indeterminate, but rather determinate, and calls it air. The air differs in rarity and in density as the nature of things is different. When very actuated, it becomes fire. When more condensed, wind, and then cold. And when still more condensed, water and earth, and stone, and all other things are composed of these. And he regards no motion as eternal, and by this, changes are produced. Hippolytus, Philosophical Manner, 7. Anaximenes, he himself a Milesian, son of Eustratus, said that the infinite air is the first principle, from which arise the things that have come and are coming into existence, and the things that will be, and gods and divine beings, while other things are produced from these, and form of air as is follows. When it is of very even consistency, it is imperceptible to vision, but it becomes evident as the result of cold or heat or moisture, or when it is moved, it is always in motion, for things would not change as they do unless it were in motion. It has a different appearance when it is made more dense or thinner. When it is expanded into thinner state, it becomes fire, and again winds are condensed air. And air becomes cloud by compression, and water when it is compressed further, and earth and finally stones as it is more condensed. So that generation is controlled by the opposites heat and cold and the broad earth and the moon and all the rest of the stars, being fiery bodies, are supported on the air by their breath. And the stars are made of earth, since exaltations arise from this. And these being attenuated become fire. And of this fire, when it is raised to the heavens, the stars are constituted. There are also bodies of an earthly nature in the place occupied by the stars, and carried along with them in their motion. He says that the stars do not move under the earth as others have supposed, but around the earth just as a cap is moved about the head. And the sun is hidden not by going underneath the sun, but because it is covered by some other higher parts of the earth, and because of its greater distance from us. The stars do not give forth heat because they are so far away. Winds are produced when the air that has been attenuated is set in motion, and when it comes together and is yet farther condensed, clouds are produced and so it changes into water. And hail is formed when the water descended from the clouds is frozen, and snow, when these being yet more filled with moisture become frozen, and lightning, when clouds are separated by violence of the winds. For when they are separated, the flash is bright and like fire, and a rainbow is produced when the sun's rays fall on compressed air, and earthquakes are produced when the earth is changed yet more by beating and cooling. Such are the opinions of Anaximenes, and he flourished about the first year of the 58th Olympiad. Plutarch, Stromatius, 3. Anaximene says that the air is the first principle of all things, and that it is infinite in quantity, but is defined by its qualities. And all things are generated by a certain condensation or rarefraction of it. Motion also exists from eternity, and by compression of the air, the earth was formed, and it is very broad. Accordingly, he says that this rests on air, and the sun and moon and the rest of the stars were formed from earth. He declared that the sun is earth because of its swift motion, and it has the proper amount of heat. Cicero, On the Nature of Gods, 1.10. Afterwards, Anaximene says that the air is God, and that it arose, and that it is boundless and infinite and always in motion, just as though air without any form could be God. 
when it is very necessary that God should be not only of some form, but of the most beautiful form, or as though everything which comes into being were not thereby subject to death. Aetius, Placita Philosophorum, 1.3 Anaximenes of Miletus, son of Eustratus, declared that the air is the first principle of things, for from this all things arise, and into this they are all resolved again. As our soul which is air, he says, holds us together, so wind and air can encompass the whole world. He uses these words air and wind synonymously. He is mistaken in thinking that animals are composed of simple homogeneous air and wind, for it is impossible that one first principle should constitute the substance of things, pushed by condensed resisting air. But an active cause is also necessary, just as silver alone is not enough to become coin. But there is need of an active cause, i.e., a coin maker. So there is need of copper and wood and other substances. 2.1. Anaximenes et al. Infinite words exist in the infinite of every cycle. 2.4. 3.31. The world is perishable. 2.1. 3.39. The sky is the revolving vault, most distant from the earth. 2.14. 3.44. The skies are fixed like nail heads in the crystalline, parentheses, vault. 2.19347. The skies shine for none of these reasons, but solely by the light of the sun. 2.22352. The sun is broad, parentheses, like a leaf. 2.23352. The stars revolve, being pushed by condensed resisting air. 3.10337. The form of the earth is like a table. 3.15379 The dryness of the air due to drought and its wetness due to rainstorms are the causes of earthquakes. 4.3387 Annex Menis et al. The soul is like air in its nature. End of part 3 Recorded by 7 Part 4 of Ancient Greek Philosopher Scientists This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by 7. Ancient Greek Philosopher Scientists A collection of the surviving words reported in ancient sources and translated by various translators. Part 4. Fragments of Epidocles of Argigentum Translated by William Ellery Leonard in the fragments of Epidiocles. 1. Hear now, Pausanias, son of wise Antaeus. 2. For narrow though thy members scattered ways of knowing lie, and many a vile surprise, blunt soul and keen desire, and having viewed their little share of life with briefest fates, like smoke they are lifted up and flit away, believing only what each chance is on, hither and thither driven, yet they boast, the larger vision of the whole and all. But thus wise never shall these things be seen, never be heard by men, nor seized by minds. And thou, since hither now withdrawn apart, shalt learn, no more than mortal ken may span. 3. Shelter these teachings in thy own mute breast. 4. But turn thy madness, gods, from tongue of mine, and drain through holy lips the wellspring clear. And many wooed, O white-armed maiden muse, thee I approach, O drive and send to me meek piety's well-reigned chariot of song, so far as lawful is men to hear, whose lives are but a day. Nor shall desire to pluck away the flowers of fame and wide report among mankind impel thee on to dare speech beyond holy bound and seat profane upon those topmost pinnacles of truth. But come, by every way of knowing see how each thing is revealed, nor, by having sight, trust sight no more than hearing will bear out. Trust echo in ear, but after tasting tongue, nor check the proof of all thy members ought. Note by all ways each thing is tis revealed. 5. Yea, but the base distrust the high and strong, yet know the pledges that our muse will urge, when once her words be sifted through thy soul. 6. And first the fourfold root of all things here, white gleaming Zeus, life bringing here Dis, and Natis, whose tears bedew mortality. 7. The uncreated elements. 8. More will I tell thee too, there is no birth of all things mortal, nor end in ruin as death but mingling only an interchange of mixed, there is, and birth is but its name with men. 9. But when in man, wild beast, or bird, or bush, these elements commingale and arrive, the realm of light, the thoughtless deem it birth, 
when they depart tis doom of death and though nor this is the law i too assent to use ten avenging death eleven fools for their thoughts are briefly brooded o'er whose trust that what is not can e'er become or at that is can wholly die away twelve for what is not what is can ne'er become so that what is should e'er be all destroyed no force can compass and no ear hath heard for there twill be forever where tis set thirteen the all hath neither void nor overflow fourteen but with the all there is no void so whence could aught of more come nigh fifteen no wise man dreams such folly in his heart that only whilst we live what men call life we have our being and take our good and ill and err as mortals we compacted be and when as mortals we loosed apart we are as nothing sixteen for even as love and hate were strong of yore they shall have their hereafter nor i think shall endless age be emptied of these twain seventeen i will report a twofold truth now grows the one from many into being now even from the one disparting come the many twofold the birth twofold the death of things for now the meeting of the many brings to birth and death and now whatever grew from out their sundering flies apart and dies and this long interchange shall never end whilst into one do all through love unite whilst two through hate of strife and in so far is the one will want to grow from many and the many again spring from primeval scattering of the one so far have they a birth and mortal date and in so far as the long interchange ends not so far forever established gods around the circle of the world they move but come but hear my words for knowledge gains make strong thy soul for as before i spake naming the utter goal of these my words i will report a twofold truth now grows the one from many into being now even from the one disparting come the many fire water earth and awful heights of air and shut from them apart the deadly strife in equipose and love within their midst in all her being in length and breadth the same behold her now with mind and sit not there with eyes astonished for tis she inborn abides established in the limbs of men through her they cherish thoughts of love through her perfect the works of concord calling her by name delight or aphrodite clear she speeds revolving in the elements but this no mortal man hath ever learned hear now the undelusive course of proof behold those elements on equal strength and equal origin each rules its task and unto each its primal mode and each prevailing conquers with revolving time and more than these there is no birth nor end for they were wasted ever and evermore they were no longer and the great all were then how to be plenished and from what far coast and how besides might they to ruin come since nothing lives that empty is of them no these are all and as they course along through one another now this now that is born and so forever down eternity eighteen love nineteen firm clasping lovingness twenty the world-wide warfare of the eternal two well in the pass of human beings limbs is shown whiles into one do they through love unite and mortal members take the bodily's form and life doth flower at the prime again dissevered by the hates perverse they wander far and wide and up and down the surf-swept beaches and drearer shores of life so too with thicket tree and gleaming fish housed in the crystal walls of waters wide and so with beasts that couch on mountain slopes and waterfowls that skim along the blue sea twenty one but come and to my words for say look well if their white witness anywhere forgot aught that behooves the elemental forms behold the sun the warm the bright diffused behold the eternal stars forever steeped in liquid heat and glowing radiance see also the rain obscure and cold and dark and how the earth streams forth the green and firm and all through wrath are split to shapes diverse and each through love draws near and yearns for each for from these elements hath budded all that was or is or evermore shall be all trees and men and women beasts and birds and fishes nourished in deep waters ay the long-lived gods in honour excellent for these are all and as they course along through one another they take new faces all by varied mingling and enduring change twenty two for amber sun and earth and heaven and sea is friendly with its every part that springs far driven and scattered in the mortal world so too these things are most apt to mix and like and love by aphrodite's haste but hostile chiefly are those things which most from one another 
differ both in birth and in their mixing, and their molded forms, and want to mingle, miserable and lone, after the counsels of their father, hate. 23. And even as artists, men who know their craft, through wits of cunning, paint with streak and hue, bright temple tablets, and will seize in hand the oozy poisons pied and red and gold, mixing harmonious, now more, now less, from which they fashion forms innumerable, peopling a fresh world, with trees and men and women, beasts and birds and fishes nourished in deep waters, aye, and long-lived gods in honours excellent, just so, and let no guile deceive thy breast, even so the spring of mortal things, lest wise of all the host born visible to man, O guard this knowledge well, for thou hast heard, in this my song, the goddess and her tale. 24. To join together diverse peaks of thought, and not complete one road that has no turn. 25. What must be said, may it be said twice o'er. 26. In turn they conquer as the cycles roll, and wane the one to other still, and wax the one to other in turn by olden fate. For these are all, as they course along through one another, they become both men and multitudinous tribes or hairy beasts, whilst in fair order, through love united all, whilst rent asunder by hate or strife, till they, when grown into the one and all, once more, once more go under and succumb, and in so far as is the one still wont, to grow from the many, and the many again, spring from my primeval scattering of the one, so far have they a birth and mortal date, and in so far as this long exchange ends not, so far forever established gods, around the circle of the world they move. 27. Their views are not the swift limbs of the sun, nor there the strength of shaggy earth, nor sea, but in the strong recesses of harmony established firm abides the rounded sphere, exultant in surrounding solitude. 27a. Nor faction, nor fight, unseemingly in its limbs. 28. The sphere on every side the boundless same, exultant in surrounding solitude. 29. For from its back there swing no branching arms. It hath no feet, nor knees alert, nor form, or life-producing member, a sphere it was, and like unto itself. 30. Yet after mighty strife had waxen great within the members of the sphere, and rose to her own honours, as the times arrived, which unto each, in turn, to strife, to love, should come by amplest oath and old decree. 31. For one by one did quake the limbs of God. 32. The joint binds too. 33. But as when rennet of the fig tree juice curdles the white milk, and will bind it fast. 34. Cementing meal with water. 35. I will now make return to paths of festal song laid down before, draining each flowing thought from flowing thought, when down the vortex to the last abyss had founded hate and lovingness had reached the eddying center of the mass. Behold, around her into oneness gathered all, yet not a sudden, but only as willingly, each from its several regions joined with each, and from their mingling hence the poured abroad, the multitudinous tribes of mortal things. Yet much unmixing among the mixed remained, as much as hate still held its scales aloft, for not all blameless did hate yield and stand, out yonder on the circle's outmost bounds, but partial-wise, yet within he stayed. Part-wise was he already from the members gone, and ever the more sculled away and fled, then ever the more, and nearer, inward pressed, the gentle-minded, the divine desire of blameless lovingness. Thence grew apace these mortal things, erstwhile long wont to be, immortal, and the erstwhile pure and sheer, were mixed, exchanging highways of new life, and from thy mingling, thence are poured abroad, the multitudinous tribes of mortal things, knit in all forms, and wonderful to see. 36. And as they came together, hate began to take his stand, far on the outer verge. 37. And earth through earth her figure magnifies, and air through air. 38. Come, I will name the like primeval four, whence rose to sight all things we now behold, earth, many billowed sea, and the moist air, and aether, the titan, who binds the globe about. 39. If earth's black deeps were endless, and all four were the white aether, as forsooth some tongues, have idly prated in the babbling mouths of those whose little of the all have seen. 40. King Dartin Helios and Selene Mild. 41. But the sun's fires, together gathered, move attendant around the mighty space of heaven. 42. And the sun's beams, the moon in passing under, covers all, and darkness a bleak tract of earth as large as the breath of her, the silver-eyed. 
43. A sunbeam striking on the moon's broad disk. 44. Towards Olympus back he darts his beams with fearless face. 45. Round earth revolves a disk of alien light. 46. Even as revolves a chariot's nave which round the outmost. 47. For toward the sacred circle of her lord she gazes face to face. 48. But earth makes night for beams of sinking sun. 49. Of night the lonely with her sightless eyes. 50. Iris from the sea brings wind and mighty rain. 51. And fire sprang upward with a rendering speed. 52. And many a fire there burns beneath the ground. 53. For sometimes so upon its course is met, and oft times otherwise. 54. In earth sang ether with deep stretching roots. 55. Earth sweat the sea. 56. The salt grew solid, smit by beams of sun. 57. There budded many a head without a neck, and arms were roaming shoulderless and bare, and eyes that wanted foreheads drifted by. 58. In isolation wandered every limb. Hither and thither, sea and union meet. 59. But now as God with God was mingled more, these members fell together where they met, and many a birth besides was then begot in the long line of ever-varied life. 60. Creatures of countless hands and trailing feet. 61. Many were born with twofold brow and breast, some with the face of man on bovine stock, some with man's form beneath a bovine head, mixed shapes of being with shadowed secret parts, sometimes like men and sometimes woman growths. 62. But come, now hear how t'was the sundered fire, led into life the gems, erst whelmed in night, of men and women, the pitied and bewailed, for tis a tale that sees and knows its mark. First rose mere lumps of earth with rude impress, that had their shares of water and of warm. These then by fire, in inward zeal to reach its kindled fire in heaven, were shot aloft, abated not yet had they revealed a form of lovely limbs, nor yet a human cry, no secret member common to the male. 63. But separate is the birth of human limbs, for tis in part in man's. 64. Love longing comes, reminding him who sees. 65. Into clean wombs the seeds are poured, and when therein they meet with God, the birth is girls, and boys when contrawise they meet with warm. 66. Into the cloven meads of Aphrodite. 67. For bellies with warmer wombs become mothers of boys, and therefore men are dark, more stalwart and more shaggy. 68. On the tenth day, in the month the eighth, the blood becomes white pus. 69. Twice bearing. 70. Sheepskin. 71. And if belief lack pith, and thou still doubt, how from the mingling of the elements, the earth and water, the ether and the sun, so many forms and hues of mortal things, could thus have been, as one have come to be, each framed and knit by Aphrodite's power. 72. As the tall trees and fish in briny floods. 73. As Cyprus, after watering earth with rain, zealous to heat her, then did give earth o'er, to speed of fire that then she might grow firm. 74. Leading the songless shoals of spawning fish. 75. Of beasts, inside compact with outside loose, which, in the palms of Aphrodite shaped, got this their sponginess. 76. Tis thus with conchs upon the heavy chines, of ocean dwellers, I, of shellfish wreathed, of stony hided turtles, where thou markst the earthen crust outside the softer parts. 77 through 78. Trees bore perennial fruit, perennial fronds, laden with fruit the whole revolving year, since fed forever by a fruitful air. 79. Thus first tall olives lay their yellow eggs. 80. Wherefore pomegranates slow in ripening be, and apples grow so plentiful in juice. 81. Wine is but water fermented in the wood, and issues from the rind. 82. From the same stuff on sturdy limbs grow hair, leaves, scales of fish, and birds thick feathered plumes. 83. Stiff hairs, keen piercing, bristle on the chines of hedgehogs. 84. As when a man about to sally forth, prepares a light and kindles him a blaze of flaming fire against the wintry night, in horny lantern shielding from all winds, though it protect from breath of flowing winds. It beams darts outward, as more fine and thin, and with untiring rays lights up the sky, just so the fire primeval once lay hid in the round pupil of the eye, enclosed in films and gauzy veils, which through and through were pierced with poles divinely fashioned, and thus kept off the watery deeps around, 
whilst fire burst outward as more fine and thin. 85. The gentle flame of eye did chance to get only a little of the earthen part. 86. From which by Aphrodite the divine the untiring eyes were formed. 87. Thus Aphrodite wrought with bolts of love. 88. One vision of two eyes is born. 89. Knowing that all things have their emanations. 90. Thus sweet seized sweet, bitter on bitter flew. Sour sprung from sour, and upon hot rode hot. 91. Water to wine is more nearly allied, but will not mix with oil. 92. As when one mixes with copper tin. 93. With flax is mixed the silvery elder's seed. 94. And the black color of the river's deeps come all from shade, and one may see the same in hollow caves. 95. As in the palms of Kripa shaped, they first began to grow together. 96. Kind earth for her broad-breasted melting pots. Of the eight parts got two of lucid nesties, and of Hypastios four. Thence came white bones, divinely joined by glue of harmony. 97. The Backbone. 98. And after earth within the perfect ports of Aphrodite anchored lay, she met almost in equal parts Hypastios's red, and rain and ether, the all splendorous, although the parts of the earth were sometimes less, sometimes a little more than theirs, from these there came our blood, and all the shapes of flesh. 99. A bell, a fleshy twig. 100. And thus does all breathe in and out. In all, over the body's surface bloodless tubes of flesh are stretched, and at their outlets, rifts innumerable along the outmost rind are bored. And so the blood remains within, for air, however, is cut a passage free. And when from here the thin blood backward streams, the air comes rushing in with roaring swell. But when again it forward leaps, the air in turn breathes out, as when a little girl plays with a water clock of gleaming bronze, as long as ever the opening of the pipe is by her pretty fingers stopped and closed, and thus why plunged within the yielding mass of silvery water, can the wet no more get in the vessel. But the air's own weight that falls inside against the countless holes keeps it in check until the child at last uncovers and sets free the thickened air. When of a truth the water's destined bulk gets in, as air gives away, even so it is, when in the belly of the brazen clock the water lies and the girl's fingertip shuts the pipe and tube, the air that from without comes pressing forward holds the water back about the passages of the gurgling neck, as the child keeps possession of the top until a hand will loosen, will amain, quite contrawise to way and wise before, pours out and under the water's destined bulk, as air drops down and in. Even so it is, with the thin blood that through our members drive, when hurrying back it streams to inward, then amain a flow of air comes rushing on. But when again it forward leaps, the air in turn breathes out along the self same way. 101. Sniffing with nostrils mites from wild beasts' limbs, left by their feet along the tender grass. 102. And thus got all things share of breath and smells. 103. Thus all things think their thought by will of chance. 104. And in so far the lightest at their fall do strike together. 105. In the blood streams, back leaping unto it, the heart is nourished, where prevails the power that men call thought. For lo, the blood that stirs about the heart is man's controlling thought. 106. For unto men their thrift of reason grows according to the body's thrift and state. 107. For as these commingled all things are, even through these men think, rejoice or grieve. 108. As far as mortals change by day, so far by night their thinking changes. 109. For tis through earth that earth we do behold, through ether divine ether luminous, through water water, through fire devouring fire, and love through love, and hate through doleful hate. 110. For if reliant on a spirit firm, with inclination and endeavor pure, thou wilt behold them, all these things shall be forever thine for service and besides, therefore full many another shalt thou gain. For of themselves into that core they grow, of each man's nature, where his essence lies. But if for others thou wilt look and reach, such empty treasures, myriad and vile, as men be after, which forevermore, blunt souls and keen desire, O oh, then shall these most swiftly leave thee as the seasons roll. For all their yearning is a quick return, unto thy own primeval stock. For know, all things have fixed intent and share of thought. 111. And thou shalt master every drug that e'er 
was made defense against sickness and old age. For thee alone all this I will fulfill. And thou shalt calm the might of tireless winds that burst on earth and ruined seed lands. I shall thou arouse the blasts, and watch them take thy vengeance, wild and shrill, for that before thou cowardest them, thou shalt change black rain to drought, at seasons good for men, and the long drought of summer shalt thou change, to torrents nourishing the mountain trees, as down the stream from ether, and thou shalt from Hades beckon the might of perished men. 112. Ye friends, who in the mighty city dwell, along the yellow Alcaeus hard by the Acropolis, ye stewards of good works, the stranger's refuge, venerable and kind, all hail, old friends, but unto ye I walk, as God immortal now, no more as man on all sides honoured fittingly and well, crowned both with fillets and with flowering wreaths, when with my throngs of men and women I come to thriving cities, I am sought by prayers, and thousands follow me that they may ask the path to wheel and vantage, craving some from oracles, while others seek to hear a healing word gainst many a foul disease, that all too long hath pierced with grievous pains. 113. Yet why urge more, as some forsooth I wrought some big affair? Do I not far excel the mortals around me, doomed to many deaths? 114. O friends, I know indeed in these words which I speak, that very truth abides. But greatly troubles unto men always hath been the emulous struggle of belief to reach their bosoms. 115. There is a word of fate, an old decree, and everlasting of the gods, made fast with amplest oaths, that whosoever of those four spirits, with their lot of age-long life, do foul their limbs with slaughter in offence, or swear foresworn, as failing of their pledge, shall wander thrice ten thousand weary years far from the blessed, and be born through time in various shapes of mortal kind, which change ever and ever troublous paths of life. For now air hunts them onward to the sea, now the wild sea disgorges them on land. Now earth will spew them towards beams of radiant sun, whence he will toss them back to whirling air. Each gets from other what they all abhor, and in that brood I too am numbered now, a fugitive and vagabond from heaven, as one obedient unto raving strife. 116. Caris abhors intolerable fate. 117. For I was once already boy and girl, thicket and bird, and mute fish in the waves. 118. I wept and wailed, beholding the strange place. 119. From what large honor and what height of bliss am I here fallen to move with mortal kind? 120. And then we came unto a roofed cave. 121. A joyless land, with slaughter and grudge, and troops of doom besides, with shriveled diseases and obscene decays, and labors burdened with the water jars, do wander down the dismal meads of bane. 122. There were earth mother, there the far-peering virgin of the sun, and bloody quarrel and grave-eyed harmony, and there was fair and foul and speed and late, black-haired confusion and sweet maiden shore. 123. Growth and decay, and sleep and roused from sleep, action and rest, and glory many crowned, and filth and silence and prevailing voice. 124. O mortal kind, O ye poor sons of grief, from such contentions and such sighing sprung. 125. For from the living he the dead did make, their forms exchanging. 126. All things doth nature change, enwrapping souls in unfamiliar tunics of the flesh. 127. The worthiest dwellings of the souls of men, when tis their lot to live in forms of brutes, are twenty lions, those great beasts that sleep, crouched on the black earth up the mountainside. But when in forms of beautiful plume trees they live, the bays are worthiest for souls. 128. Nor unto them was any heir as God, nor Kaidomius, nor Zeus, the king of gods, nor Cronos, nor Pisodium, then, but only Crispus' queen, whom they with holy gifts were wont to appease, with costly unguents of rich fragrancy, with gentle sacrifices of taintless myrrh, with redolent fumes of frankincense of old, pouring libations out upon the ground of yellow honey, not then with unmixed blood of many bulls was ever an altar stained, but among men to a sacrilege most vile to reeve of life and eat the godly limbs. 129. Was one among them there, a supreme man, of vastest knowledge, gainer of large wealth, of understanding and chief master wise of diverse works of skill and wisdom all? For whensoever he sought with scope and reach of understanding, then twas his view, readily each and every thing that e'er in ten or twenty human ages throve. 130. All things were tame and gentle towards men, 
all beasts and birds, and friendship's flame blew fair. 131. For since, O Muse and Dian, that couldst deign, to give for these our paltry human cares, a gateway to thy soul, O now much more, Calliope of the beautiful dear voice, be near me now, beseeching, whilst I speak, excelling thoughts about the blessed gods. 132. O well with them, who hath secured his wealth, of thoughts divine, O wretched he whose care is shadowy speculation of the gods. 133. We may not bring it near us with our eyes, we may not grasp it with our human hands. Where neither hands nor eyes, whose highways twain, whereby belief drops into minds of men. 134. For tis adorned with never a man-like head, for from its back there swing no branching arms, it hath no feet nor knees alert, no form of tufted secret member, but it lives, one holy mind, ineffable alone, and with swift thoughts darts through the universe. 135. But the wide law of all extends throughout, broad ruling either, and the vast white sky. 136. Will ye not cease from this great din of slaughter? Will ye not see, and thinking as ye are, how ye rend one another unbeknown? 137. The Father lifteth for the stroke of death his own dear son with changed form, and slits his throat for sacrifice with prayers. A blinded fool, but the poor victims press imploring their destroyers. Yet not one, but still is deaf to piteous moan and wail. Each slits the throat, and in his halls prepares a horrible repast. Thus too the son seizes the father, children the mother sees, and reeve of life and death their own dear flesh. 138. Drawing the soul as water with a bronze. 139. Ah, woe is me, that never a pitiless day destroyed me long ago, ere yet my lips did meditate this feeding's monstrous crime. 140. Withhold your hands from leaves of Phoebus tree. 141. Ye wretched, O ye altogether wretched, your hands from beans withhold. 142. Neither roofed halls of ages holding Zeus delight, nor dire Hecate's vengeance house. 143. Scooping from fountains five with lasting bronze. 144. O fast from evil doing. 145. Since wielded by your evil doings huge, ne'er shall ye free your life from heavy pains. 146. And seers at last, and singers of high hymns, physicians, sage, and chiefs, all earth-born men, shall they become whence germinate the gods their excellent in honours. 147. At hearth and feast companioned with the immortals, from human pains and wasting eld immune. 148. Man enfolding earth. 149. The cloud collecting. 150. The blood full liver. 151. Life giving. 152. Evening. The day's old age. 153. The belly. 153a. In seven times seven days. End of part four. Recording by seven. Part five of Ancient Greek Philosopher Scientists. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ancient Greek Philosopher Scientists. A collection of their surviving words reported in ancient sources and translated by various translators. Part 5. Fragments and Testimonials on Heraclitus of Ephesus. Translation by G. T. W. Patrick in The Fragments of the Work of Heraclitus of Ephesus on Nature. Fragments 1. It is wise for those who hear not me, but the universal reason, to confess that all things are one. 2. To this universal reason which I unfold, although it always exists, men make themselves insensible, both before they have heard it, and when they have heard it for the first time. For notwithstanding that all things happen according to this reason, men act as though they had never had any experience in regard to it, when they attempt such words and works as I am now relating, describing each thing according to its nature, and explaining how it is ordered. And some men are as ignorant of what they do when awake, as they are forgetful of what they do when asleep. 3. Those who hear and do not understand are like the deaf. 
Of them, the proverb says, present, they are absent. 4. Eyes and ears are bad witnesses to men having rude souls. 5. The majority of people have no understanding of the things with which they daily meet, nor, when instructed, do they have any right knowledge of them, although to themselves they seem to have. 6. They understand neither how to hear nor how to speak. 7. If you do not hope, you will not win that which is not hoped for, since it is unattainable and inaccessible. 8. Gold seekers dig over much earth and find little gold. 9. Debate. 10. Nature loves to conceal herself. 11. The god whose oracle is at Delphi neither speaks plainly nor conceals, but indicates by signs. 12. But the Sibyl, with raging mouth uttering things solemn, rude, and unadorned, reaches with her voice over a thousand years, because of the God. 13. Whatever concerns seeing, hearing, and learning, I particularly honour. 15. The eyes are more exact witnesses than the ears. 16. Much learning does not teach one to have understanding, else it would have taught Hesiod and Pythagoras, and again Xenophanes and Hecateus. 17. Pythagoras, son of Nesarchus, practised investigation most of all men, and having chosen out these treatises, he made a wisdom of his own, much learning and bad art. 18. Of all whose words I have heard, no one attains to this, to know that wisdom is apart from all. 19. There is one wisdom, to understand the intelligent will, by which all things are governed through all. 20. This world, the same for all, neither any of the gods nor any man has made but it always was, and is, and shall be, an ever-living fire, kindled in due measure, and in due measure extinguished. 21. The transmutations of fire are, first, the sea, and of the sea half is earth, and half the lightning flash. 22. All things are exchanged for fire, and fire for all things, just as wares for gold, and gold for wares. 23. The sea is poured out and measured, to the same proportion as existed before it became earth. 24. Craving and satiety. 25. Fire lives in the death of earth, air lives in the death of fire. Water lives in the death of air, and earth in the death of water. 26. Fire, coming upon all things, will sift and seize them. 27. How can one escape that which never sets? 28. Lightning rules all. 29. The sun will not overstep his bounds, for, if he does, the Erinyes, helpers of justice, will find him out. 30. The limits of the evening and morning are the bear, and opposite the bear the bounds of bright Zeus. 31. If there were no sun, it would be night. 32. The sun is new every day. 35. Hesiod is a teacher of the masses. 
they suppose him to have possessed the greatest knowledge, who indeed did not know day and night, for they are one. 36. God is day and night, winter and summer, war and peace, plenty and want. But he is changed, just as when incense is mingled with incense, but named according to the pleasure of each. 38. Souls smell in Hades. 39. Cold becomes warm, and warm cold. Wet becomes dry, and dry wet. 40. It disperses and gathers. It comes and goes. 41. Into the same river you could not step twice, for other and still other waters are flowing. 42. To those entering the same river, other and still other waters flow. 44. War is the father and king of all, and has produced some as gods and some as men, and has made some slaves and some free. 45. They do not understand how that which separates unites with itself, it is a harmony of oppositions, as in the case of the bow and of the lyre. 47. The hidden harmony is better than the visible. 48. Let us not draw conclusions rashly about the greatest things. 49. Philosophers must be learned in very many things. 50. The straight and crooked way of the wool carders is one and the same. 51. Asses would choose stubble rather than gold. 52. Sea water is very pure and very foul, for, while to fishes it is drinkable and healthful, to men it is hurtful and unfit to drink. 54. They revel in dirt. 55. Every animal is driven by blows. 56. The harmony of the world is a harmony of oppositions, as in the case of the bow and of the lyre. 57. Good and evil are the same. 59. Unite whole and part, agreement and disagreement, accordant and discordant, from all comes one, and from one all. 60. They would not know the name of justice, were it not for these things. 62. We must know that war is universal, and strife right, and that by strife all things arise, and are used. 63. For it is wholly destined. 64. Death is what we see waking. What we see in sleep is a dream. 65. There is only one supreme wisdom. It wills and wills not to be called by the name of Zeus. 66. The name of the bow is life, but its work is death. 67. Immortals are mortal, mortals immortal living in their death and dying in their life. 68. To souls it is death to become water, and to water it is death to become earth, but from earth comes water, and from water soul. 69. The way upward and downward are one and the same. 70. The beginning and end are common. 71. The limits of the soul you would not find out, though you should traverse every way. 72. To souls it is joy to become wet. 73. A man, when he is drunken, is led by a beardless youth, stumbling, ignorant where he is going, having a wet soul. 74. The dry soul is the wisest and best. 
75. The dry beam is the wisest and best soul. 76. Where the land is dry, the soul is wisest and best. 77. Man, as a light at night, is lighted and extinguished. 79. Time is a child playing at draughts, a child's kingdom. 80. I have inquired of myself. 81. Into the same river we both step and do not step. We both are and are not. 82. It is weariness upon the same things to labour, and by them to be controlled. 83. In change is rest. 84. A mixture separates when not kept in motion. 85. Corpses are more worthless than excrement. 86. Being born, they will only to live and die, or rather to find rest, and they leave children who likewise are to die. 89. In thirty years a man may become a grandfather. 91. The law of understanding is common to all. Those who speak with intelligence must hold fast to that which is common to all, even more strongly than a city holds fast to its law. For all human laws are dependent upon one divine law. For this rules as far as it wills, and suffices for all and overabounds. 92. Although the law of reason is common, the majority of people live as though they had an understanding of their own. 93. They are at variance with that with which they are in most continual association. 94. We ought not to act and speak as though we were asleep. 96. For human nature does not possess understanding, but the divine does. 97. The thoughtless man understands the voice of the deity as little as the child understands the man. 100. The people must fight for their law as for their walls. 101. Greater fates gain greater rewards. 102. Gods and men honour those slain in war. 103. Presumption must be quenched even more than a fire. 104. For men to have whatever they wish would not be well. Sickness makes health pleasant and good. Hunger, satiety. Weariness, rest. 105. It is hard to contend against passion, for whatever it craves, it buys with its life. 106. It pertains to all men to know themselves and to learn self-control. 107. Self-control is the highest virtue, and wisdom is to speak truth and consciously to act according to nature. 108. It is better to conceal ignorance, but it is hard to do so in relaxation and over wine. 109. It is better to conceal ignorance than to expose it. 110. It is law also to obey the will of one. 111. For what sense or understanding have they? They follow minstrels and take the multitude for a teacher, not knowing that many are bad and few good. For the best men choose one thing above all, immortal glory among mortals. But the masses stuff themselves like cattle. 112. In Priene there lived Bias, son of Teutamus, whose word was worth more than that of others. 113. To me one is ten thousand, if he be the best. 
114. The Ephesians deserve, man for man, to be hung, and the youth to leave the city, inasmuch as they have banished Hermodorus, the worthiest man among them, saying, Let no one of us excel, and if there be any such, let him go elsewhere, and among other people. 115. Dogs also bark at what they do not know. 116. By its incredibility, it escapes their knowledge. 117. A stupid man loves to be puzzled by every discourse. 118. The most approved of those who are of repute knows how to cheat. Nevertheless, justice will catch the makers and witnesses of lies. 120. One day is like all. 121. A man's character is his demon. 122. There awaits men after death what they neither hope nor think. 123. And those that are there shall arise and become guardians of the living and the dead. 124. Night roamers, magians, bacchanals, revellers in wine, the initiated. 125. For the things which are considered mysteries among men, they celebrate sacrilegiously. 126. And to these images they pray, as if one should prattle with the houses, knowing nothing of gods or heroes, who they are. 127. For were it not Dionysus, to whom they institute a procession, and sing songs in honour of the Pudenda, it would be the most shameful action. But Dionysus, in whose honour they rave in Bacchic frenzy, and Hades are the same. 129. Atonements 130. When defiled, they purify themselves with blood, just as if any one who had fallen into the mud should wash himself with mud. Testimonials Polybius 4.40 Especially at the present time, when all places are accessible, either by land or by water, we should not accept poets and mythologists as witnesses of things that are unknown, since, for the most part, they furnish us with unreliable testimony about disputed things, according to Heraclitus. Diogenes Laertius, 1.23 He, that is, Thales, seems, according to some, to have been the first to study astronomy, and to foretell the eclipses and motions of the sun, as Eudemus relates in his account of astronomical works. And for this reason he is honoured by Xenophanes and Herodotus, and both Heraclitus and Democritus bear witness to him. Plutarch, Platonic Questions 8.4 Thus time, having a necessary union and connection with heaven, is not simple motion, but, so to speak, motion in an order, having measured limits and periods, of which the sun, being overseer and guardian, to limit, direct, appoint, and proclaim the changes and seasons, which, according to Heraclitus, produce all things, is the helper of the leader, and first God, not in small or trivial things, but in the greatest and most important. Aristotle, On Sense and the Sensible, 5. Some think that odour consists in smoky exhalation, common to earth and air, and that for smell all things are converted into this. And it was for this reason that Heraclitus thus said, that if all existing things should become smoke, perception would be by the nostrils. Aristotle, Eudemian Ethics, 7, 1. And Heraclitus blamed the poet who said, Would that strife were destroyed from among gods and men. 
for there could be no harmony without sharps and flats, nor living beings without male and female, which are contraries. Aristotle, Nicomachean Ethics, 8, 2 In reference to these things, some seek for deeper principles, and more in accordance with nature. Euripides says, The parched earth loves the rain, and the high heaven, with moisture laden, loves earthward to fall. And Heraclitus says, The unlike is joined together, and from differences results the most beautiful harmony, and all things take place by strife. Columella on Agriculture 8. 4. Dry dust and ashes must be placed near the wall, where the roof or eaves shelter the court, in order that there may be a place where the birds may sprinkle themselves, for with these things they improve their wings and feathers. If we may believe Heraclitus, the Ephesian, who says, Hogs wash themselves in mud, and doves in dust. Hippolytus, Refutation of All Heresies, 9.10 and good and evil are one. The physicians, therefore, says Heraclitus, cutting, cauterizing, and in every way torturing the sick, complain that the patients do not pay them fitting reward for thus effecting these benefits and sufferings. Scoliast B. in Iliad 4.4 4. They say that it is unfitting that the sight of wars should please the gods, but it is not so, for noble works delight them, and while wars and battles seem to us terrible, to God they do not seem so, for God, in his dispensation of all events, perfects them into a harmony of the whole, just as, indeed, Heraclitus says, that to God all things are beautiful and good and right, though men suppose that some are right and others wrong. Plutarch Consolation to Apollonius, 10. For when is death not present with us? As indeed Heraclitus says, Living and dead, awake and asleep, young and old, are the same, for these several states are transmutations of each other. Plutarch, about the Pythia's oracles, 11. Those who adopt the reading Hebontos, that is, at man's estate. Reckon a generation at thirty years, according to Heraclitus, in which time a father may have a son, who is himself at the age of puberty. John Lydus, De Mensibus, 3, 10. Thirty is the most natural number, for it bears the same relation to tens as three to units. Then again it is the monthly cycle, and is composed of the four numbers 1, 4, 9, 16, which are the squares of the units in order. Not without reason, therefore, does Heraclitus call the month a generation. Marcus Antoninus, 4.42 We all work together to one end, some consciously and with purpose, others unconsciously. Just as indeed Heraclitus, I think, says that the sleeping are co-workers and fabricators of the things that happen in the world. Plutarch on Superstition 3 Heraclitus says, To those who are awake there is one world in common, but of those who are asleep each is withdrawn to a private world of his own. Plato, Hippias Major, 289b and does not Heraclitus, whom you bring forward, say the same, that the wisest of men, compared with God, appears an ape in wisdom, and in beauty, and in all other things? Plato, Hippias Major, 289a You are ignorant, my man, that there is a good saying of Heraclitus, to the effect that the most beautiful of apes is ugly when compared with another kind, and the most beautiful of earthen pots is ugly when compared with maiden kind, as says Hippias the wise. Diogenes Laertius 9.1 And he, Heraclitus, used to say that Homer deserved to be driven out of the lists and flogged, and Archilochus likewise. Iamblichus, 
on mysteries. 5.16 I distinguish two kinds of sacrifices. First, those of men wholly purified, such as would rarely happen in the case of a single individual, as Heraclitus says, or of a certain very few men. Second, material and corporeal sacrifices, and those arising from change, such as are fit for those still fettered by the body. End of Part 5「6」of「Ancient Greek Philosopher Scientists」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ernst Patinama, Amsterdam, the Netherlands, 9-11-2008 Ancient Greek Philosopher Scientists – A Collection of Their Surviving Words – reported in ancient sources, and translated by various translators. Part 6. Fragments of Parmenides of Ilia, translated by John Burnett in Early Greek Philosophy, 3rd edition. The car that bears me carried me as far as ever my heart desired, when it had brought me and set me on the renowned way of the goddess which leads the man who knows through all the towns. On that way was I borne along, for on it did the wise steeds carry me, drawing my car, and maidens showed the way. And the axle, glowing in the socket, for it was urged round by the whirling wheels at each end, gave forth a sound as of a pipe, when the daughters of the sun, hasting to convey me into the light, threw back their veils from off their faces, and left the abode of night. There are the gates of the ways of night and day, fitted above with the lintel, and below with the threshold of stone. They themselves, high in the air, are closed by mighty doors, and avenging justice keeps the keys that fit them. Her did the maidens entreat with gentle words, and cunningly persuade to unfasten without demur the bolted bars from the gates. Then, when the doors were thrown back, they disclosed a wide opening when their brazen posts, fitted with rivets and nails, swung back one after the other. Straight through them, on the broad way, did the maidens guide the horses and the car, and the goddess greeted me kindly and took my right hand in hers, and spake to me these words. Welcome, O youth, that comest to my abode on the car that bears thee, tended by immortal charioteers. It is no ill chance, but right and justice, that has sent thee forth to travel on this way. Far indeed does it lie from the beaten track of men. Meet it is that thou shouldst learn all things as well the unshaken heart of well-rounded truth, as the opinions of mortals in which is no true belief at all. Yet, none the less, shalt thou learn these things also, how, passing right through all things, one should judge the things that seem to be. But do thou restrain thy thought from this way of inquiry, nor let habit, by its much experience, force thee to cast upon this way a wandering eye or sounding ear. Or tongue, but judge by argument the much disputed proof uttered by me. There is only one way left that can be spoken of. Look steadfastly with thy mind at things, though afar, as if they were at hand. Thou canst not cut off what is from holding fast to what is, neither scattering itself abroad in order nor coming together. It is all one to me where I begin, for I shall come back again there. Come now, I will tell thee, and do thou hearken to my saying, and carry it away, the only two ways of search that can be thought of. The first, namely, that it is, and that it is impossible for it not to be, is the way of belief, for truth is its companion. 
the other namely that it is not and that it must needs not be that i tell thee is a path that none can learn of at all for thou canst not know what is not that is impossible nor utter it for it is the same thing that can be thought and that can be it needs must be that what can be spoken and thought is for it is possible for it to be and it is not possible for what is nothing to be this is what i bid thee ponder i hold thee back from this first way of inquiry and from this other also upon which mortals knowing not wander two-faced for helplessness guides the wandering thought in their breasts so that they are borne along stupefied like men deaf and blind undiscerning crowds who hold that it is and is not the same and not the same and all things travel in opposite directions for this shall never be proved that the things that are not are and do thou restrain thy thought from this way of inquiry one path only is left for us to speak of namely that it is in this path are very many tokens that what is is uncreated and indestructible for it is complete immovable and without end nor was it ever nor will it be for now it is all at once a continuous one for what kind of origin for it wilt thou look for in what way and from what source could it have drawn its increase i shall not let thee say nor think that it came from what is not for it can neither be thought nor uttered that anything is not and if it came from nothing what need could have made it arise later rather than sooner therefore must it either be altogether or be not at all nor will the force of truth suffer aught to arise besides itself from that which is not wherefore justice doth not lose her fetters and let anything come into being or pass away but holds it fast our judgment thereon depends on this is it or is it not surely it is adjudged as it needs must be that we are to set aside the one way as unthinkable and nameless for it is no true way and that the other path is real and true how then can what is be going to be in the future or how could it come into being if it came into being it is not nor is it if it is going to be in the future thus is becoming extinguished and passing away not to be heard of nor is it divisible since it is all alike and there is no more of it in one place than in another to hinder it from holding together nor less of it but everything is full of what is wherefore it is wholly continuous for what is is in contact with what is moreover it is movable in the bonds of mighty chains without beginning and without end since coming into being and passing away have been driven afar and true belief has cast them away it is the same and it rests in the self-same place abiding in itself and thus it remaineth constant in its place for hard necessity keeps it in the bonds of the limit that holds it fast on every side wherefore it is not permitted to what is to be infinite for it is in need of nothing while if it were infinite it would stand in need of everything the thing that can be thought and that for the sake of which the thought exists is the same for you cannot find thought without something that is as to which it is uttered and there is not and never shall be anything besides what is since fate has changed it so as to be whole and immovable wherefore all these things are but names which mortals have given believing them to be true coming into being and passing away being and not being change of place and alteration of bright color since then 
it has the furthest limit it is complete on every side like the mass of a rounded sphere equally poised from the centre in every direction for it cannot be greater or smaller in one place than in another for there is no nothing that could keep it from reaching out equally nor can aught that is be more here and less there than what is since it is all inviolable for the point from which it is equal in every direction tends equally to the limits here shall i close my trustworthy speech and thought about the truth henceforward learn the beliefs of mortals giving ear to the deceptive ordering of my words mortals have made up their minds to name two forms one of which they should not name and that is where they go astray from the truth they have distinguished them as opposite in form and have assigned to them marks distinct from one another to the one they lot the fire of heaven gentle very light in every direction the same as itself but not the same as the other the other is just the opposite to it dark night a compact and heavy body of these i tell thee the whole arrangement as it seems likely for so no thought of mortals will ever outstrip thee now that all things have been named light and night and the names which belong to the power of each have been assigned to these things and to those everything is full at once of light and dark night both equal since neither is aught to do with the other and thou shalt know the substance of the sky and all the signs in the sky and the resplendent works of the glowing sun's pure torch and whence they arose and thou shalt learn likewise of the wandering deeds of the round-faced moon and of her substance thou shalt know too the heavens that surround us whence they arose and how necessity took them and bound them to keep the limits of the stars how the earth and the sun and the moon and the sky that is common to all and the milky way and the outermost olympus and the burning might of the stars arose the narrower bands were filled with unmixed fire and those next them with night and in the midst of these rushes their portion of fire in the midst of these is the divinity that directs the cause of all things for she is the beginner of all painful birth and all begetting driving the female to the embrace of the male and the male to that of the female first of all the gods she contrived eros shining by night with borrowed light wandering round the earth always looking to the beams of the sun for just as thought stands at any time to the mixture of its erring organs so does it come to men for that which thinks is the same namely the substance of the limbs in each and every man for their thought is that of which there is more in them on the right boys on the left girls thus according to men's opinions did things come into being and thus they are now in time they will grow up and pass away to each of these things men have assigned a fixed name end of part six recording by ernst patinama Part 7 of Ancient Greek Philosopher Scientists. This is a LibraVox recording. All LibraVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibraVox.org. Recording by Enko. Ancient Greek Philosopher Scientists, a collection of their surviving words reported in ancient sources and translated by various translators. Part 7. Testimonials on Pythagoras of Samos and the Pythagoreans translated by Arthur Furbanks in the first philosophers of Greece. Plato, Phaedon 62b, the saying that is uttered in secret rites, to the effect that we men are in a sort of prison, and that one ought not to lose himself from it, nor yet to run away. Seems to me something great and not easy to see through, but this at least I think is well said, that it is the gods who care for us, and we men are one of the possessions of the gods, Plato, Cratylus 400b, for some say that it, the body, is the tomb of the soul, 
i think it was the followers of orpheus in particular who introduced this word which has this enclosure like a prison in order that it may be kept safe plateau gorgias four hundred and ninety three a i once heard one of the wise men say that now we are dead and the body is our tomb and that that part of the soul where desires are it so happens is open to persuasion and moves upward or downward and indeed a clever man perhaps some inhabitant of sicily or italy speaking allegorically and taking the word from credible and persuadable called this a jar and he called those without intelligence uninitiated and that part of the soul of uninitiated persons where the desires are he called its intemperateness and said it was not watertight as a jaw might be pierced with holes using the simile because of its insatiate desires plateau gorgias five hundred and seven a and the wise men say that one community embraces heaven and earth and gods and men and friendship and order and temperance and rightness and for that reason they call this whole a universe my friend for it is not without order nor yet is there excess it seems to me that you do not pay attention to these things though you are wise in regard to them but it has escaped your notice that geometrical equality prevails widely among both gods and men aristotle physics three four two hundred and three eight one for all who think they have worthily applied themselves to such philosophy have discoursed concerning the infinite and they all have asserted some first principle of things some like the pythagoreans and plato a first principle existing by itself not connected with anything else but being itself the infinite in its essence only the pythagoreans found it among things perceived by sense for they say that number is not an abstraction and they held that it was the infinite outside the heavens aristotle physics three four two hundred and four a thirty three the pythagoreans both hold that the infinite is being and divide it aristotle physics four six two hundred and thirteen b twenty two and the pythagoreans say that there is a void and that it enters into the heaven itself from the infinite air as though it the heaven were breathing and this void defines the natures of things inasmuch as it is a certain separation and definition of things that lie and this is true first in the case of numbers for the void defines the nature of these aristotle on the heavens one two hundred and sixty eight a ten for as the pythagoreans say the all and all things are defined by phrase for end and middle and beginning constitute the number of the all and also the number of the triad aristotle and the heavens two 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 hundred and eighty four b six and since there are some who say that there is a right and left of the heavens as for instance those that are called pythagoreans for such is their doctrine we must investigate whether it is as they say aristotle and the heavens two 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 hundred and eighty five a ten wherefore one of the pythagoreans might be surprised in that they say that there are only these two first principles the right and the left and they pass over four of them as not having the least validity for there is no less difference up and down and front and back than there is right and left in all creatures aristotle and the heavens two 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 hundred and eighty five b twenty three and some are dwelling in the upper hemisphere and to the right while we dwell below and to the left which is the opposite to what the pythagoreans say for they put us above and to the right while the others are below and at the left aristotle and the heavens two nine two hundred and ninety b fifteen some think it necessary that noise should arise when so great bodies are in motion since sound does arise from bodies among us which are not so large and do not move so swiftly and from the sun and moon and from the stars in so great number and of so great size moving so swiftly there must necessarily arise a sound inconceivably great assuming these things and that the swiftness has a principle of harmony by reason of the intervals they say that the sound of the stars moving on in a circle becomes musical and since it seems unreasonable that we also do not hear this sound they say that the reason for this is that the noise exists in the very nature of things so as not to be distinguishable from the opposite silence for the distinction of sound and silence lies in their contrast with each other so that as blacksmiths think there is no difference between them because they are accustomed to the sound so the same thing happens to men aristotle on the heavens two nine two hundred and ninety one a seven what occasions the difficulty and makes the pythagoreans say that there is a harmony of the bodies as they move is a proof 
for whatever things move themselves make a sound and noise but whatever things are fastened in what moves or exists in it as the parts in a ship cannot make a noise nor yet does the ship if it moves in a river aristotle on the heavens two thirteen two hundred and ninety three a nineteen they say that the whole heaven is limited the opposite to what those of italy call the pythagoreans say for these say that fire is at the centre and that the earth is one of the stars and that moving in a circle about the centre it produces night and day and they assume yet another earth opposite this which they call the counter earth not seeking reasons and causes for phenomena but stretching phenomena to meet certain assumptions and opinions of theirs and attempting to arrange them in a system and farther the pythagoreans say that the most authoritative part of the all stands god because it is specially fitting that it should and this part is the centre and this place that the fire occupies they call the god of zeus as it is called simply the centre that is the centre of space and the centre of matter and of nature aristotle on the heavens three one three hundred a fifteen the same holds true for those who construct the heaven out of numbers for some construct nature out of numbers as do certain of the pythagoreans aristotle metaphysics one five nine hundred and eighty five b twenty three nine hundred and eighty six b eight with these and before them anazagoras empedocles atomist those called pythagoreans applying themselves to the sciences first developed them and being brought up in them they thought that the first principle of these that is numbers were the first principle of all things and since of those sciences numbers are by nature the first in numbers rather than in fire and earth and water they thought they saw many likeness to things that are and that are coming to be as for instance justice is such a property of numbers and soul and mind are such a property and another is opportunity and of other things one may say the same of each one and further discerning in numbers the conditions and reason of harmonies also since moreover other things seem to be like numbers in their entire nature and numbers were the first of every nature they assumed that the elements of numbers were the elements of all things and that the whole heavens were harmony and number and whatever characteristics in numbers and harmonics they could show were in agreement with the properties of the heavens and its parts and with its whole arrangement these they collected and adapted and if there chanced to be any gap anywhere they eagerly sought that the whole system might be connected with these stray phenomena to give an example of my meaning inasmuch as ten seemed to be the perfect number and to embrace the whole nature of numbers they asserted that the number of bodies moving through the heavens were ten and when only nine were visible for the reason just stated they postulated the counter earth as the tenth we have given a more definite account of these thinkers in other parts of our writings but we have referred to them here with this purpose in view that we might ascertain from them what they asserted as the first principles and in what manner they came upon the causes that have been enumerated they certainly seem to consider number as the first principle and as it were the matter in things and in their conditions and states and the odd and the even or elements of number and of these the one is infinite and the other finite and unity is the product of both of them for it is both odd and even and number arises from unity and the whole heaven as has been said is numbers a different party in this same school say that the first principles are ten named according to the following table finite and infinite even and odd one and many right and left male and female rest and motion straight and crook light and darkness good and bad square and oblong after this manner Archmeon of croton seems to have conceived them and either he received this doctrine from them or they from him for Archmeon arrived at maturity when pythagoras was an old man and his teachings resemble theirs for he says that most human affairs are twofold not meaning opposites reached by definition as did the former party but opposites by chance as for example white black sweet bitter good bad small great this philosopher let fall his opinions indefinitely about the rest but the pythagoreans declared the number of opposites and what they were from both one may learn this much that opposites are the first principles of things but from the latter he may learn the number of these and what they are but how it is possible to bring them into relation with the causes of which we have spoken if they have not clearly worked out but they seem to range their elements under the category of matter for they say that being is compounded and formed from them and that they inhere in it 
aristotle metaphysics 1 987 a 9 to 27 down to the italian philosophers and with the exception of them the rest have spoken more reasonably about these principles except that as we said they do indeed use two principles and the one of these whence is motion some regard as one and others as twofold the pythagoreans however while they in similar manner assume two first principles add this which is peculiar to themselves that they do not think that the finite and the infinite and the one or certain other things by nature such as fire or earth or any other such thing but the infinite itself and unity itself are the essence of the things of which they are predicated and so they make number the essence of all things so they thought after this manner about them and began to discourse and to define what being is but they made it altogether too simple a matter for they made their definition superficially and to whatever first the definition might apply this they thought to be the essence of the matter as if one should say that twofold and two were the same because the twofold subsists in the two but undoubtedly the two and the twofold are not the same otherwise the one will be many a consequence which even they would not draw so much then may be learned from the earlier philosophers and from their successors aristotle metaphysics one six nine hundred and eight seven b ten and plato only changed the name for the pythagoreans say that things exist by imitation of numbers but plato by sharing the nature of numbers aristotle metaphysics one six nine hundred and eight seven b twenty two but that the one is the real essence of things and not something else with unity as an attribute he affirms agreeing with the pythagoreans and in harmony with them he affirms that numbers are the principles of being for other things but it is peculiar to him that instead of a single infinite he posits a double infinite an infinite of greatness and of littleness and it is also peculiar to him that he separates numbers from things that are seen while they say that numbers are the things themselves and do not interpose mathematical objects between them this separation of the one and numbers from things in contrast with the position of the pythagoreans and the introduction of the ideas of the consequence of his investigation by concepts aristotle metaphysics one eight nine hundred and eighty nine b thirty two nine hundred and ninety a thirty two those however who carry on their investigation with reference to all things and divide things into what are perceived and what are not perceived by sense evidently examine both classes so one must delay a little longer over what they say they speak correctly and incorrectly in reference to the questions now before us now those who are called pythagoreans use principles and elements yet stranger than those of the physicists in that they do not take them from the sphere of sense for mathematical objects are without motion except in the case of astronomy still they discourse about everything in nature and study it they construct the heaven they observe what happens in its parts and their states and motions they apply to these their first principles and causes as though they agreed entirely with the other physicists that being is only what is perceptible and what that which is called heaven includes but their causes and first principles they say are such as to lead up to the higher parts of reality and are in harmony with this rather than with the doctrines of nature in what manner motion will take place when finite and infinite odd and even are the only underlying realities they do not say nor how it is possible for genesis and destruction to take place without motion and change or for the heavenly bodies to revolve further if one grant to them that greatness arises from these principles or if this could be proved nevertheless how will it be that some bodies are light and some heavy for their postulates and statements apply no more to mathematical objects than to things of sense accordingly they have said nothing at all about fire or earth or any such objects because i think they have no distinctive doctrine about things of sense further how is it necessary to assume that number and states of number are the causes of what is in the heavens and what is taking place there from the beginning and now and that there is no other number than that out of which the world is composed for when opinion and opportune time are at a certain point in the heavens and a little farther up or down are injustice and judgment or a mixture of them and they bring forward as proof that each one of these is number and the result then is that at this place there is already a multitude of compounded quantities because those states of number have each their place is this number in heaven the same which it is necessary to assume that each of these things is or is it something different plato says it is different still he thinks that both these things and the causes of them are numbers but the one class are ideal causes and the others are sense causes aristotle metaphysics two one nine hundred and ninety six a four 
and the most difficult and perplexing question of all is whether unity and being are not as plato and the pythagoreans say something different from things but their very essence or whether the underlying substance is something different friendship as empedocles says or as another says fire or water or air aristotle metaphysics two four one thousand one a nine plato and the pythagoreans assert that neither being nor yet unity is something different from things but that it is the very nature of them as though essence itself consisted in unity and existence aristotle metaphysics two one thousand thirty six b seventeen so it turns out that many things of which the forms appear different have one form as the pythagoreans discovered and one can say that there is one form for everything and the others are not forms and thus all things will be one aristotle metaphysics nine two one thousand fifty three b eleven whether the one itself is a sort of essence as first the pythagoreans and later plato affirmed aristotle metaphysics eleven seven one thousand seventy two b thirty one and they are wrong who assume as do the pythagoreans and specipus that the most beautiful and the best is not in the first principle because the first principles of plants and animals are indeed causes for that which is beautiful and perfect is in what comes from these first principles aristotle metaphysics twelve four one thousand seventy eight b twenty one the pythagoreans before democritus only defined a few things the concepts of which they reduced to numbers as for instance opportunity or justice or marriage aristotle metaphysics twelve six one thousand eighty b sixteen the pythagoreans say that there is but one number the mathematical but things of sense are not separated from this for they are composed of it indeed they construct the whole heaven out of numbers but not out of unit numbers for they assume that the unities have quantity but how the first unity was so constituted as to have quantity they seem at a loss to say all as many as regard the one as the element and first principle of things except the pythagoreans assert that numbers are based on the unit but the pythagoreans assert as has been remarked that numbers have quantity aristotle metaphysics twelve eight one thousand eighty three b nine the pythagorean standpoint has on the one hand fewer difficulties than those that have been discussed but it has new difficulties of its own the fact that they do not regard numbers separate removes many of the contradictions but it is impossible that bodies should consist of numbers and that this number should be mathematical nor is it true that indivisible elements have quantity but granted that they have this quality of indivisibility the units have no quantity for how can quantity be composed of indivisible elements but arithmetical number consists of units but we say that things are number at least they adapt their speculations to such bodies as consist of elements which are numbers aristotle metaphysics thirteen three one thousand ninety a twenty on the other hand the pythagoreans because they see many qualities of numbers in bodies perceived by sense regard objects as numbers not as separate numbers but as derived from numbers and why because the qualities of numbers exist in harmony both in the heaven and in many other things but for those who hold that number is mathematical only it is impossible on the basis of their hypothesis to say any such thing and it has already been remarked that there can be no science of these numbers but we say as above that there is a science of numbers evidently the mathematical does not exist apart by itself for in that case its qualities could not exist in bodies in such a matter the pythagoreans are restrained by nothing when however they construct out of numbers physical bodies out of numbers that have neither weight nor lightness bodies that have weight and lightness they seem to be speaking about another heaven and other bodies than those perceived by sense aristotle ethics one four one thousand ninety six b five and the pythagoreans seem to speak more persuasively about it putting the unity in the coordination of good things aristotle ethics two five one thousand one hundred and six b twenty nine the evil partakes of the nature of the infinite the good of the finite as the pythagoreans conjectured aristotle ethics five eight one thousand one hundred and thirty two b twenty one reciprocity seems to some to be absolutely just as the pythagoreans say for this define the just as that which is reciprocal to another aristotle great ethics one 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 thousand one hundred and eighty two a eleven first pythagoras attempted to speak concerning virtue but he did not speak correctly for bringing virtues into correspondence with numbers he did not make any distinct i choose placita philosophorum 
one three two hundred and eighty and again from another starting point pythagoras son of mesarchus a samian who was the first to call this matter by the name of philosophy assume as first principles the numbers and the symmetries existing in them which he calls harmonies and the elements compounded of both that are called geometrical and again he includes the monad and the undefined dyad among the first principles and for him one of the first principles tends toward the creative and form-giving cause which is intelligence that is god and the other tends toward the passive and material cause which is the visible universe and he says that the starting point of number is the decad for all greeks and all barbarians count as far as ten and when they get as far as this they return to the monad and again he says the power of the ten is in the four and the tetrad and the reason is this if any one returning from the monad adds the numbers in a series as far as the four he will fill out the number ten that is one plus two plus three plus four is equal to ten but if he goes beyond the number of a tetrad he will exceed the ten just as if one should add one and two and should add to these three and four he will fill out the number ten so that according to the monad number is in the ten but potentially in the four wherefore the pythagoreans were wont to speak as though the greatest oath were the tetrad by him that transmitted to our soul the tetractes which has the spring and root of ever-flowing nature and our soul he says is composed of a tetrad for it is intelligence understanding opinion sense from which things come every art and science and we ourselves become reasoning beings the monad however is intelligence for intelligence is according to the monad as for example men are made up of many parts and part by part they are devoid of sense and comprehension and experience yet we perceive that man as one alone whom no being resembles possesses these qualities and we perceive that a horse is one but part by part it is without experience for these are all forms and classes according to monads wherefore assigning this limit with reference to each one of these they speak of a reasoning being and a neighing being on this account the monad is intelligence by which we perceive these things and the undefined dyad is science fittingly for all proof and all persuasion is part of science and further every syllogism brings together what is questioned out of some things that are agreed upon and easily proves something else and science is the comprehension of these things wherefore it would be the dyad and opinion as the result of comprehending them is the triad fittingly for opinion has to do with many things and the triad is quantity as the thrice blessed danai on this account then he includes the triad and their sect is called italic because pythagoras taught in italy for he removed from samos his fatherland because of dissatisfaction with the tyranny of Polycrates. one seven pythagoras held that one of the first principles the monad is god and the good which is the origin of the one and is itself intelligence but the undefined dyad is a divinity and the bad surrounding which is the mass of matter one eight three hundred and seven divine spirits are psychical beings and heroes are souls separated from bodies good heroes are good souls bad heroes are bad souls one nine three hundred and seven the followers of Thales and pythagoras and the stoics held that matter is variable and changeable and transformable and in a state of flux the whole through the whole one ten three hundred and nine pythagoras asserted that the so-called forms and ideas existed in numbers and their harmonies and in what are called geometrical objects apart from bodies one eleven three hundred and ten pythagoras and aristotle asserted that the first causes are immaterial but that other causes involve a union or contact with material substance so that the world is material one fourteen three hundred and twelve the followers of pythagoras held that the universe is a sphere according to the form of the four elements but the highest fire alone is conical one fifteen three hundred and fourteen the pythagoreans call color the manifestation of matter one sixteen three hundred and fourteen bodies are subject to change of condition and are divisible to infinity one eighteen three hundred and sixteen and in his first book on the philosophy of pythagoras he writes that the heaven is one and that time and wind and the void which always defines the places of each thing are introduced from the infinite and among other things he says that place is the immovable limit of what surrounds the world or that in which bodies abide and are moved and that it is full when it surrounds body on every side and empty when it has absolutely nothing in itself accordingly it is necessary for place to exist and body 
and it is never empty except only from the standpoint of thought for the nature of it in perpetuity is destructive of the interrelation of things and of the combination of bodies and motions arise according to place of bodies that surround and oppose each other and no infiniteness is lacking either of quantity or of extent one twenty four hundred and eighteen pythagoras said that time is a sphere of what surrounds the world one twenty one four hundred and eighteen pythagoras plateau motion is a certain otherness or difference in matter this is the common limit of all motion one twenty four four hundred and twenty pythagoras and all that assume that matter is subject to change assert that genesis and destruction in an absolute sense take place for from change of the elements and modification and separation of them there take place just opposition and mixture and intermingling and melting together two one four hundred and twenty seven pythagoras first named the circumference of all things the universe by reason of the order in it two four three hundred and thirty pythagoras plato and the stoics held that the universe is brought into being by god and it is perishable so far as its nature is concerned for it is perceived by sense and therefore material it will not however be destroyed in accordance with the foreknowledge and plan of god two six four hundred and thirty four pythagoras the universe is made from five solid figures which are called also mathematical of these he says that earth has arisen from a cube fire from the pyramid air from the octahedron and water from the icosahedron and the sphere of the whole from the dodecahedron to nine hundred and thirty eight the followers of pythagoras hold that there is a void outside the universe into which the universe breathes forth and from which it breathes in to ten three hundred and thirty nine pythagoras plato aristotle the right hand side of the universe is the eastern part from which comes the beginning of motion and the left hand side is the west they say the universe has neither height nor depth in which statement height means distance from below upwards and depth from above downwards for none of the distances thus described exist for the universe inasmuch as it is disposed around the middle of itself from which it extends towards the whole and with reference to which it is the same on every side to twelve three hundred and forty fierce pythagoras and their followers the sphere of the whole heaven is divided into five circles which they call zones the first of these is called the arctic zone and is ever visible the second the summer solstice the third the equinoctial the fourth the winter solstice and fifth the antarctic zone which is invisible and the ecliptic called the zodiac in the three middle ones is projected to touch the three middle ones and the meridian crosses all these from the north to the opposite quarter at right angles it is said that pythagoras was the first to recognize the slant of the zodiacal circle which oenipoids of Chios appropriated as his own discovery to thirteen three hundred and forty three heraclides and the pythagoreans asserted that each world of the stars is air and either surrounding earth in the infinite ether and these doctrines are brought out in the orphic writings for they construct each world of the stars two twenty two three hundred and fifty two the pythagoreans the sun is spherical two twenty three three hundred and fifty three plato pythagoras aristotle the solstices lie along the slant of the zodiacal circle for which the sun goes along the zodiac and with the accompaniment of the tropic circles and all these things also the globe shows two twenty four four hundred and fifty four an eclipse takes place when the moon comes past two twenty five four hundred and fifty seven pythagoras the moon is a mirror like body two twenty nine four hundred and sixty some of the pythagoreans according to the aristotelian account and the statement of philip the opuntian said that an eclipse of the moon takes place sometimes by the interposition of the earth sometimes by the interposition of the counter earth but it seems to some more recent thinkers that it takes place by a spreading of the flame little by little as it is gradually kindled until it gives a complete full moon and again in like manner it grows less until the conjunction when it is completely extinguished to twenty four hundred and sixty one some of the pythagoreans among them philolaus said that the earthy appearance of the moon is due to its being inhabited by animals and by plants like those on our earth only greater and more beautiful for the animals on it are fifteen times as powerful not having any sort of excrement and their day is fifteen times as long as ours but others said that the outward appearance in the moon is a reflection on the other side of the inflamed circle of the sea that is on our earth some regard the greater year as the sixty-year period among whom are occupids and pythagoras 
one some of the pythagoreans said that the milky way is the burning of a star that fell from its own foundation setting on fire the region through which it passed in a circle as phaeton was burned and others say that the course of the sun arose in this manner at the first and certain ones say that the appearance of the sun is like a mirror reflecting its rays toward the heaven and therefore it happens at times to reflect its rays on the rainbow in the clouds three two three hundred and sixty six some of the followers of pythagoras say that the comet is one of the stars that are not always shining but emit their light periodically through a certain definite time but others say that it is the reflection of our vision into the sun like reflected images three fourteen three hundred and seventy eight pythagoras of the earth after the analogy of the sphere of the all is divided into five zones arctic antarctic summer winter and equinoctial of these the middle one he defines to be the middle of the earth called for this very reason the torrid zone but the inhabited one the one between the arctic and the torrid zone being well tempered for two pythagoras holds that number moves itself and he takes number as an equivalent for intelligence four four three hundred and eighty nine pythagoras plateau according to a superficial account the soul is of two parts the one possessing the other lacking reason but according to close and exact examination of three parts for the unreasoning part they divide into the emotions and the desires the successors of pythagoras saying that body is a mixture of five elements for they rank the ether as a fifth along with the four held that the powers of the soul are of the same number as these and these they name intelligence and wisdom and understanding and opinion and sense perception four five four hundred and ninety one pythagoras the principle of life is about the heart but the principle of reason and intelligence is about the head four five four hundred and ninety two pythagoras et al the intelligence enters from without four seven four hundred and ninety two pythagoras plateau the soul is imperishable four nine four hundred and ninety six pythagoras et al the sense perceptions are deceptive four nine three hundred and ninety seven pythagoras plateau each of the sensations is pure proceeding from each single element with reference to vision it was of the nature of ether hearing of the nature of wind smell of the nature of fire taste of the nature of moisture touch of the nature of earth four fourteen four hundred and five the followers of pythagoras and of the mathematicians on reflections of vision for visions move directly as it were against the bronze of a mirror and meeting with a firm smooth surface it is turned and bent back on itself meeting some such experience as when the arm is extended and then bent back to the shoulder four twenty four hundred and nine pythagoras plateau aristotle sound is immaterial for it is not air but it is the form about the air and the appearance of the some sort of percussion which becomes sound and every appearance is immaterial for it moves with bodies but is itself absolutely immaterial as in the case of a bent rod the surface appearance suffers no change but the matter is what is bent five one four hundred and fifteen pythagoras did not admit the sacrificial part alone of augury five three four hundred and seventeen pythagoras the seed is foam of the best part of the blood a secretion from the nourishment like blood and marrow five four four hundred and seventeen pythagoras plateau aristotle the power of seed is immaterial like intelligence the moving power but the matter that is poured forth is material five twenty four hundred and thirty two pythagoras plateau the source of animals called unreasoning or reasonable not however with active reasoning powers because of an imperfect mixture of the bodies and because they do not have the power of speech as in the case of apes and dogs for these have intelligence but not the power of speech arius didymus epitome fr thirty two apollodorus in the second book concerning the codes it is the pythagorean opinion that the morning and the evening star are the same theophrastus physics fr seventeen favorinus says that he pythagoras was the first to call the heavens a universe and the earth round cicero on the nature of gods one eleven for pythagoras who held that soul is extended through all the nature of things and mingled with them and that from this our souls are taken did not see that god would be separated and torn apart by the separation of human souls and when souls are wretched as might happen to many then part of god would be wretched a thing which could not happen hippolytus philosophumena 
too there is a second philosophy not far distant from the same time of which pythagoras whom some call a samian was the first representative and this they call the italian philosophy because pythagoras fled the rule of polycrates over the samians and settled in a city of italy where he spent his life the successive leaders of his sect shared the same spirit and he in his studies of nature mingled astronomy and geometry and music and thus he asserted that god is a monad and examining the nature of number with especial care he said that the universe produces melody and is put together with harmony and he first proved the motion of the seven stars to be rhythm and melody and in wonder at the structure of the universe he decreed that at first his disciples should be silent as it were mystery were coming into the order of the all then when he thought they had sufficient education in the principles of truth and had sought wisdom sufficiently in regard to stars and in regard to nature he pronounced them pure and then bade them speak he separated his disciples into two groups and called one esoteric and the other exoteric to the former he entrusted the more perfect sciences to the latter the more moderate and he dealt with magic as they say and himself discovered the art of physiognomy postulating both numbers and measures he was wont to say that the first principle of arithmetic embraced philosophy by combination after the following manner number is the first principle a thing which is undefined incomprehensible having in itself all numbers which could reach infinity in amount and the first principle of numbers is in substance the first monad which is a male monad begetting as a father all other numbers secondly the dyad is female number and the same is called by the arithmetician even thirdly the triad is male number this the arithmeticians have been wont to call odd finally the tetrad is a female number and the same is called even because it is female all numbers then taken by classes or fours for number is undefined in reference to class of which is composed the perfect number the decad for the series one two three and four becomes ten if its own name is kept in its essence by each of the numbers pythagoras said that this sacred tetraquits is the spring having the roots of ever-flowing nature in itself and from these numbers have their first principle for the eleven and the twelve and the rest derive from the ten the first principle of their being the four parts of the decad this perfect number are called number monad power and cube and the interweavings and minglings of these in the origin of growth are what naturally completes nascent number for when a power is multiplied upon itself it is the power of a power and when a power is multiplied on a cube it is the power of a cube and when a cube is multiplied on a cube the cube of a cube thus all numbers from which arises the genesis of what arises are seven number monad power cube power of a power power of a cube cube of a cube he said that the soul is immortal and that it changes from one body to another so he was wont to say that he himself had been born before the trojan war as Ephilides, and at the time of the trojan war as euphorbus and after that as hermotimus of samos then as pyrrhus of delos fifth as pythagoras and Judas of eretoria and aristoxenus the musician say that pythagoras had come into zarastas of chaldea and he set forth that in his view there were from the beginning two causes of things father and mother and the father is light and the mother darkness and the parts of light are warm dry light swift and of darkness are cold moist heavy slow and of these the universe is composed of male and female and he sees that the universe exists in accordance with musical harmony so the sun also makes an harmonious period and concerning the things that arise from the earth and the universe they say that zarata spoke as follows there are two divinities one of the heavens and the other of the earth the one of the earth produces things from the earth and it is water and the divinity of the heavens is fire with a portion of air warm and cold wherefore he says that none of these things will destroy or even pollute the soul for these are the essence of all things and it is said that zaratas forbade men to eat beans because he said that at the beginning and composition of all things when the earth was still a whole the bean arose and he says that the proof of this is that if one chooses a bean to a pulp and exposes it to the sun for a certain time for the sun will affect it quickly 
it gives out the odor of human seed and he says that there is another and clearer proof if when a bean is in flower we were to take the bean and its flower and putting it into a pitcher moisten it and then bury it in the earth and after a few days dig it up again we should see in the first place that it had the form of a womb and examining it closely we should find the head of a child growing with it he perished in a conflagration with his disciples in croton in italy and it was the custom when one became a disciple for him to burn his property and to leave his money under a seal with pythagoras and he remained in silence sometimes three years sometimes five years and studied and immediately on being released from this he mingled with the others and continued a disciple and made his home with them otherwise he took his money and was sent off the esoteric class were called pythagoreans and the others pythagoristae and those of the disciples who escaped the conflagration were lysis and archippus and zalmoxis the slave of pythagoras who is said to have taught the pythagorean philosophy to the druids among the celts it is said that pythagoras learned numbers and measures from the egyptians astonished at the wisdom of the price which was deserving of belief and full of fancies and difficult to buy he imitated it and he himself also taught his disciples to be silent and obliged the student to remain quietly in rooms underneath the earth epiphanius panorion three eight pythagoras the samian son of mescorcus said that the monad is god and that nothing has been brought into being apart from this he was wont to say that wise men ought not to sacrifice animals to the gods nor yet to eat what had life or beans nor to drink wine and he was wont to say that all things from the moon downward were subject to change while from the moon upward they were not and he said that the soul goes at death into other animals and he bade his disciples to keep silence for a period of five years and finally he named himself a god End of part seven. Recording by Anchor. Part eight of Ancient Greek Philosopher Scientists. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman Ancient Greek Philosopher Scientists, a collection of their surviving words reported in ancient sources and translated by various translators. Part 8. Testimonials on Thales of Miletus Translated by Arthur Fairbanks in The First Philosophers of Greece Plato on the Laws, 10, 899b And as for all the stars and the moon and the years and the months and all the seasons, can we hold any other opinion about them than this same one, that inasmuch as soul or souls appear to be the cause of all these things, and good souls the cause of every excellence, we are to call them gods, whether they order the whole heavens as living beings in bodies, or whether they accomplish this in some other form and manner. Is there any one who acknowledges this, and yet holds that all things are not full of gods? Aristotle, Metaphysics 1, 3, 983, b. 6. Most of the early students of philosophy thought that first principles in the form of matter, and only these, are the sources of all things. For that of which all things consist, the antecedent from which they have sprung, and into which they are finally resolved, in so far as being underlies them and is changed with their changes, this, they say, is the element and first principle of things. Aristotle, Metaphysics, 1, 3, 983, b. 18. As to the quantity and form of this first principle, there is a difference of opinion. But Thales, the founder of this sort of philosophy, says that it is water. Accordingly, he declares that the earth rests on water, getting the idea, I suppose, 
because he saw that the nourishment of all beings is moist, and that warmth itself is generated from moisture and persists in it, for that from which all things spring is the first principle of them. And getting the idea also from the fact that the germs of all beings are of a moist nature, while water is the first principle of the nature of what is moist. And there are some who think that the ancients, and they who lived long before the present generation, and the first students of the gods, had a similar idea in regard to nature. For in their poems Oceanos and Tethys were the parents of generation, and that by which the gods swore was water. The poets themselves called it Styx. For that which is most ancient is most highly esteemed, and that which is most highly esteemed is an object to swear by. Whether there is any such ancient and early opinion concerning nature would be an obscure question, but Thales is said to have expressed this opinion in regard to the first cause. Aristotle on Heavens 2.13 294a28. Some say that the earth rests on water. We have ascertained that the oldest statement of this character is the one accredited to Thales the Milesian, to the effect that it rests on water floating like a piece of wood or something else of that sort. Aristotle on the Soul 1, 2, 405 a 19 and thales according to what is related of him seems to have regarded the soul as something endowed with the power of motion if indeed he said that the lodestone has a soul because it moves iron aristotle on the soul 1 5 411 a 7 some say that soul is diffused throughout the whole universe, and it may have been this which led Thales to think that all things are full of gods. Simplicius, Commentary on Aristotle's On the Soul, 8, R32, 16.3 Thales posits water as the element, but it is the element of bodies, and he thinks that the soul is not a body at all. Speaking thus of Thales, he adds with a degree of reproach that he assigned a soul to the magnetic stone as the power which moves the iron, that he might prove soul to be a moving power in it. But he did not assert that this soul was water, although water had been designated as the element, since he said that water is the element of substances, but he supposed soul to be unsubstantial form. Simplicius, Commentary on Aristotle's On the Soul, 20, R73, 22. For Thales also, I suppose, thought all things to be full of gods, the gods being blended with them. And this is strange. Simplicius, Commentary on Aristotle's Physics, 6R23-21 Of those who say that the first principle is one and movable, to whom Aristotle applies the distinctive name of physicists, some say that it is limited, as for instance Thales of Miletus, son of Examaes, and Hippo who seems also to have lost belief in the gods. These say that the first principle is water, and they are led to this result by things that appear to sense, for warmth lives in moisture, and dead things wither up, and all germs are moist, and all nutriment is moist. Now it is natural that things should be nourished by that from which each has come, and water is the first principle of moist nature. Accordingly, they assume that water is the first principle of all things, and they assert that the earth rests on water. Thales is the first to have set on foot the investigation of nature by the Greeks, although so many others preceded him, in Theophrastus's opinion, he
he so far surpassed them as to cause them to be forgotten. It is said that he left nothing in writing except a book entitled Nautical Astronomy. Hippolytus, Philosophumina I. It is said that Thales of Miletus, one of the seven wise men, was the first to undertake the study of physical philosophy. He said that the beginning, the first principle, and the end of all things is water. All things acquire firmness as this solidifies, and again as it is melted their existence is threatened. To this are due earthquakes and whirlwinds and movements of the stars. And all things are movable and in a fluid state, the character of the compound being determined by the nature of the principle from which it springs. This principle is God, and it has neither beginning nor end. Thales was the first of the Greeks to devote himself to the study and investigation of the stars, and was the originator of this branch of science. On one occasion he was looking up at the heavens, and was just saying he was intent on studying what was overhead, when he fell into a well. Whereupon a maidservant named Thratta laughed at him and said, In his zeal for things in the sky, he does not see what is at his feet. And he lived in the time of Croesus. Plutarch, Stromatice, one. He says that Thales was the earliest thinker to regard water as the first principle of all things. For from this all things come, and to it they all return. Aetius, Placita Philosophorum, 1-2. Thales of Miletus regards the first principle and the elements as the same thing. But there is a very great difference between them, for elements are composite, but we claim that first principles are neither composite nor the result of processes. So we call earth, water, air, fire, elements, and we call them first principles for the reason that there is nothing antecedent to them from which they are sprung, since this would not be a first principle, but rather that from which it is derived. Now there is something anterior to earth and water from which they are derived, namely the matter that is formless and invisible, and the form which we call entelechy and privation. So Thales was in error when he called water an element and a first principle. 1, 3, 276 Thales the Milesian declared that the first principle of things is water. This man seems to have been the first philosopher, and the Ionic school derived its name from him, for there were very many successive leaders in philosophy. And Thales was a student of philosophy in Egypt, but he came to Miletus in his old age, for he says that all things come from water and are resolved into water. The first basis for this conclusion is the fact that the seed of all animals is their first principle, and it is moist. Thus it is natural to conclude that all things come from water as their first principle. Secondly, the fact that all plants are nourished by moisture and bear fruit, and unless they get moisture, they wither away. Thirdly, the fact that the very fire of the sun and the stars is fed by the exhalations from the waters, and so is the universe itself. 1. 7. 301. Thales said that the mind in the universe is God, and the all is endowed with soul and is full of spirits and its divine moving power pervades the elementary water. 1. 8. 307 Thales et Alii say that spirits are psychical beings, and that heroes are souls separated from bodies, good heroes are good souls, bad heroes are bad souls. 1. 8. 307 
The followers of Thales et Alii assert that matter is turned about, varying, changing, and in a fluid state, the whole in every part of the whole. 1. 12. 310. Thales and his successors declared that the first cause is immovable. 1. 16. 314. The followers of Thales and Pythagoras hold that bodies can receive impressions and can be divided even to infinity and so can all figures, lines, surfaces, solids, matter, place, and time. 1. 18. 315. The physicists, followers of Thales, all recognize that the void is really a void. 1. 21. 321. Thales, Necessity is most powerful, for it controls everything. 2. 1. Thales and his successors hold that the universe is one. 2. 12. 340. Thales et Alii hold that the sphere of the entire heaven is divided into five circles which they call zones, and of these the first is called the arctic zone and is always visible, the next is the summer solstice, the next is the equinoctial, the next the winter solstice, and the next the antarctic which is invisible and the ecliptic in the three middle ones is called the zodiac, and is projected to touch the three middle ones. All these are cut by the meridian at a right angle from the north to the opposite quarter. 2. 13. 341. The stars consist of earth, but are on fire. 2. 20. 349. The sun consists of earth. 224. 353. The eclipses of the sun take place when the moon passes across it in direct line, since the moon is earthy in character, and it seems to the eye to be laid on the disk of the sun. 228. 358. The moon is lighted from the sun. 229.360. Thales et Alii agree with the mathematicians that the monthly phases of the moon show that it travels along with the sun and is lighted by it, and eclipses show that it comes into the shadow of the earth the earth coming between the two heavenly bodies and blocking the light of the moon. 3. 9 to 10. 376. The earth is one and spherical in form. 3. 11. 377. It is in the midst of the universe. 3.15.379. Thales and Democritus find in water the cause of earthquakes. 4.1.384. Thales thinks that the Etesian winds blowing against Egypt raise the mass of the Nile, because its outflow is beaten back by the swelling of the sea which lies over against its mouth. 4, 2, 386. Thales was the first to declare that the soul is by nature always moving or self-moving. 5, 26, 438. Plants are living animals. This is evident from the fact that they wave their branches and keep them extended, and they yield to attack and relax them freely again, so that weights also draw them down. 
Cicero, On the Nature of Gods, 110. For Thales of Miletus, who first studied these matters, said that water is the first principle of things, while God is the mind which formed all things from water. If gods exist without sense and mind, why should God be connected with water, if mind itself can exist without a body? End of Part 8 Recording by Graham Redman Part 9 of Ancient Greek Philosopher Scientists This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Coleman Ancient Greek Philosopher Scientists A collection of their surviving words reported in ancient sources and translated by various translators. Part 9 Fragments and Testimonials on Xenophanes of Colophon, translated by Arthur Fairbanks in The First Philosophers of Greece. Fragments 1. God is one, supreme among gods and men, and not like mortals in body or in mind. 2. The whole of God sees, the whole perceives, the whole hears. 3. But without effort he sets in motion all things by mind and thought. 4. It, i.e. being, always abides in the same place, not moved at all, nor is it fitting that it should move from one place to another. 5. But mortals suppose that the gods are born, as they themselves are, and that they wear man's clothing, and have human voice and body. 6. But if cattle or lions had hands so as to paint with their hands and produce works of art as men do, they would paint their gods and give them bodies in form like their own, horses like horses, cattle like cattle. 7. Homer and Hesiod attributed to the gods all things which are disreputable and worthy of blame when done by men, and they told of them many lawless deeds, stealing, adultery, and deception of each other. 8. For all things come from earth, and all things end by becoming earth. 9. For we are all sprung from earth and water. 10. All things that come into being and grow are earth and water. 11. The sea is the source of water and the source of wind. For neither would blasts of wind arise in the clouds and blow out from within them, except for the great sea. Nor would the streams of rivers, nor the rainwater in the sky exist, but for the sea. But the great sea is the begetter of clouds, and winds, and rivers. 12. This upper limit of earth at our feet is visible and touches the air, but below it reaches to infinity. 13. She whom men call Iris, rainbow, this also is by nature cloud, violet and red and pale green to behold. 14. Accordingly, there has not been a man, nor will there be, who knows distinctly what I say about the gods, or in regard to all things, for even if one chances for the most part to say what is true, still he would not know, but every one thinks he knows. 15. These things have seemed to me to resemble the truth. 16. In the beginning the gods did not at all reveal all things clearly to mortals, but by searching men in the course of time find them out better. 17. The following are fit topics for conversation for men reclining on a soft couch by the fire in the winter season, when after a meal they are drinking sweet wine and eating a little pulse. Who are you, and what is your family? What is your acre, my friend? 
How old were you when the Medes invaded this land? 18. Now, however, I come to another topic, and I will show the way. They say that once on a time when a hound was badly treated, a passer-by pitied him and said, Stop beating him, for it is the soul of a dear friend. I recognized him on hearing his voice. 19. But if one wins a victory by swiftness of foot, or in the pentathlon, where the grove of Zeus lies by Pisces' stream at Olympia, or as a wrestler, or in painful boxing, or in that severe contest called the Pancratian, he would be more glorious in the eyes of the citizens, he would win a front seat at assemblies, and would be entertained by the city at the public table, and he would receive a gift which would be a keepsake for him. If he won by means of horses, he would get all these things, although he did not deserve them, as I deserve them. For our wisdom is better than the strength of men or of horses. This is indeed a very wrong custom, nor is it right to prefer strength to excellent wisdom. For if there should be in the city a man good at boxing, or in the pentathlon, or in wrestling, or in swiftness of foot, which is honoured more than strength among the contests men enter into at the games, the city would not on that account be any better governed. Small joy would it be to any city in this case if a citizen conquers at the games on the banks of the Pisas, for this does not fill with wealth its secret chambers. 20. Having learned profitless luxuries from the Lydians, while as yet they had no experience of hateful tyranny, they proceeded into the market-place, no less than a thousand in number all told, with purple garments completely covering them, boastful, proud of their comely looks, anointed with unguents of rich perfume. 21. For now the floor is clean, the hands of all and the cups are clean. One puts on the woven garlands, another passes around the fragrant ointment in a vase. The mixing bowl stands full of good cheer, and more wine, mild and of delicate bouquet, is at hand in jars, which says it will never fail. In the midst, frankincense sends forth its sacred fragrance, and there is water, cold and sweet and pure. The yellow loaves are near at hand, and the table of honour is loaded with cheese and rich honey. The altar in the midst is thickly covered with flowers on every side. Singing and mirth fill the house. Men making merry should first hymn the God with propitious stanzas and pure words. And when they have poured out libations and prayed for power to do the right, since this lies nearest at hand, then it is no unfitting thing to drink as much as will not prevent your walking home without a slave, if you are not very old. And one ought to praise that man who, when he has drunk, unfolds noble things as his memory and his toil for virtue suggest. But there is nothing praiseworthy in discussing battles of titans, or of giants, or centaurs, fictions of former ages, nor in plotting violent revolutions. But it is good always to pay careful respect to the gods. Testimonials Aristotle Rhetorics 2.23 1.399 B6 Xenophanes asserts that those who say the gods are born are as impious as those who say that they die. For in both cases it amounts to this, that the gods do not exist at all. Aristotle, Rhetorics, 2.23, 1400b5 When the inhabitants of Elia asked Xenophanes whether they should sacrifice to Leucothea and sing a dirge or not, he advised them not to sing a dirge if they thought her divine, and if they thought her human, not to sacrifice to her. Plutarch, on compliancy, P530F. When Lasos, 
son of Hermione's, called that man a coward who was unwilling to play at dice with him, Xenophanes answered that he was very cowardly and without daring in regard to dishonourable things. Diogenes Laertius, 920. When Empedocles said to him, Xenophanes, that the wise man was not to be found, he answered, naturally, for it would take a wise man to recognise a wise man. Plutarch, Against the Stoics on Common Conceptions, P. 1084-E. Xenophanes, when someone told him that he had seen eels living in hot water, said, then we will boil them in cold water. Diogenes Laertius, 919. Have intercourse with tyrants, either as little as possible, or as agreeably as possible. Clement of Alexandria, Stramatius 7. And Greeks suppose the gods to be like men in their passions, as well as in their forms, and accordingly they represent them, each race, in forms like their own. In the words of Xenophanes, Ethiopians make their gods black and snub-nosed, Thracians red-haired and with blue eyes, so also they conceive the spirits of the gods to be like themselves. Aulus Gellius, Attic Nights, 311 Some writers have stated that Homer antedated Hesiod, and among these were Philochorus and Xenophanes of Colophon. Others assert that he was later than Hesiod. Plato, Sophist, 242d. And the Eleatic group of thinkers among us, beginning with Xenophanes and even earlier, set forth in tales how what men call all things is really one. Aristotle, On the Heavens, 213, 294 a 21. On this account, some assert that there is no limit to the earth underneath us, saying that it is rooted in infinity, as, for instance, Xenophanes of Colophon, in order that they may not have the trouble of seeking the cause. Aristotle, Metaphysics, 1, 5, 986, b. 10. There are some who have expressed the opinion about the all, that it is one in its essential nature, but they have not expressed this opinion after the same manner, nor in an orderly or natural way. Aristotle, Metaphysics, 1, 5, 986, b. 23. Xenophanes first taught the unity of these things. Parmenides is said to have been his pupil. But he did not make anything clear, nor did he seem to get at the nature of either of these things. But looking up into the broad heavens, he said, The unity is God. These, as we have said, are to be dismissed from the present investigation, two of them entirely as being rather more crude, Xenophanes and Melissos. But Parmenides seems to speak in some places with greater care. Simplicius, Commentary on Aristotle's Physics, 5v, 2236. Theophrastus says that Xenophanes of Colophon, teacher of Parmenides, asserted that the first principle is one, and that being is one and all-embracing, and is neither limited nor infinite, neither moving nor at rest. Theophrastus admits, however, that the record of his opinion is derived from some other source than the investigation of nature. This all-embracing unity, Xenophanes called God, he shows that God is one, because God is the most powerful of all things. For, he says, if there be a multiplicity of things, it is necessary that power should exist in them all alike. But the most powerful and most excellent of all things is God. It is natural that God should be one, for if there were two or more, he would not be the most powerful and most excellent of all. If, then, there were several beings, some stronger, some weaker, they would not be gods, for it is not the nature of God to be ruled. 
nor would they have the nature of God if they were equal. For God ought to be the most powerful, but that which is equal is neither better nor worse than its equal. And he shows that God must have been without beginning, since whatever comes into being must come either from what is like it or from what is unlike it. But he says, it is no more natural that like should give birth to like than that like should be born from like. But if it had sprung from what is unlike it, then being would have. So he showed that God is without beginning and eternal, nor is it either infinite or subject to limits. For not being is infinite, as having neither beginning nor middle nor end. Moreover, limits arise through the relation of a multiplicity of things to each other. Similarly, he denies to it both motion and rest, for not being is immovable, since neither could anything else come into it, nor could it itself come into anything else. Motion, on the one hand, arises among the several parts of the one, for one thing changes its position with reference to another, so that when he says that it abides in the same state, and is not moved, and it always abides in the same place, not moved at all, nor is it fitting that it should move from one place to another, he does not mean that it abides in a rest that is the antithesis of motion, but rather in a stillness that is out of the sphere of both motion and rest. Nicolaus of Damascus, in his book On the Gods, mentions him as saying that the first principle of things is infinite and immovable. According to Alexander, he regards this principle as limited and spherical, but that Xenophanes shows it to be neither limited nor infinite is clear from the very words quoted. Alexander says that he regarded it as limited and spherical because it is homogeneous throughout, and he holds that it perceives all things, saying, but without effort, he sets in motion all things by mind and thought. Several of the commentators have made false statements about Xenophanes, as for instance Sabinos, who uses almost these very words. I say that man is not air, as Anaximenes taught, nor water, as Thales taught, nor earth, as Xenophanes says in some book. But no such opinion is found to be expressed by Xenophanes anywhere, and it is clear from Sabinus's own words that he made a false statement intentionally, and did not fall into error through ignorance. Else he would certainly have mentioned by name the book in which Xenophanes expressed this opinion. On the contrary, he wrote, as Xenophanes says in some book. Theophrastus would have recorded this opinion of Xenophanes in his abridgment of the opinions of the physicists, if it were really true. And if you are interested in the investigation of these things, you can read the books of Theophrastus, in which he made this abridgment of the opinions of the physicists. Hippolytus, Philosopher Mina 114. Xenophanes of Colophon, son of Orthomenes, lived to the time of Cyrus. He was the first to say that all things are incomprehensible, in the following verses. For even if one chances for the most part to say what is true, still he would not know, but every one thinks he knows. And he says that nothing comes into being, nor is anything destroyed, nor moved and that the universe is one, and is not subject to change. And he says that God is eternal and one, homogeneous throughout, limited, spherical, with power of sense perception in all parts. The sun is formed each day from small fiery particles which are gathered together. The earth is infinite, and is not surrounded by air or by sky. An infinite number of suns and moons exist, and all things come from earth. The sea, he said, is salt, because so many things flow together and become mixed in it. 
but metrodorus assigns as the reason for its saltness that it has filtered through the earth and xenophanes believes that once the earth was mingled with the sea but in the course of time it became freed from moisture and his proofs are such as these that shells are found in the midst of the land and among the mountains that in the quarries of syracuse the imprints of a fish and of seals had been found and in paros the imprint of an anchovy at some depth in the stone and in melite shallow impressions of all sorts of sea products he says that these imprints were made when everything long ago was covered with mud and then the imprint dried in the mud further he says that all men will be destroyed when the earth sinks into the sea and becomes mud and that the race will begin anew from the beginning and this transformation takes place for all worlds Aetius, placata philosophorum one three xenophanes held that the first principle of all things is earth for he wrote in his book on nature all things come from earth and all things end by becoming earth two four xenophanes et al the world is without beginning eternal imperishable two thirteen three hundred and forty three the stars are formed of burning cloud these are extinguished each day but they are kindled again at night like coals for their risings and settings are really kindlings and extinguishings two eighteen three hundred and forty seven the objects which appear to those on vessels like stars and which some call dioscori are little clouds which have become luminous by a certain kind of motion two twenty three hundred and forty eight the sun is composed of fiery particles collected from the moist exhalation and massed together or of burning clouds two twenty four three hundred and fifty four eclipses occur by extinction of the sun and the sun is born anew at its risings xenophanes recorded an eclipse of the sun for a whole month and another eclipse so complete that the day seemed as night two twenty four three hundred and fifty five Xenophanes held that there are many suns and moons according to the different regions and sections and zones of the earth and that at some fitting time the disk of the sun comes into a region of the earth not inhabited by us and so it suffers eclipse as though it had gone into a hole he adds that the sun goes on for an infinite distance but it seems to turn around by reason of the great distance 225 356 the moon is a compressed cloud 228 358 it shines by its own light 229 360 the moon disappears each month because it is extinguished 230 362 the sun serves a purpose in the generation of the world and of the animals on it as well as in sustaining them and it drags the moon after it three two three hundred and sixty seven comets are groups or motions of burning clouds three 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 hundred and sixty eight lightnings take place when clouds shine in motion three four three hundred and seventy one the phenomena of the heavens come from the warmth of the sun as the principal cause for when the moisture is drawn up from the sea the sweet water separated by reason of its lightness becomes mist and passes into clouds and falls as rain when compressed and the winds scatter it for he writes expressly the sea is the source of water four nine three hundred ninety six sensations are deceptive five one four hundred and fifteen xenophanes and epicurus abolished the prophetic art end of part nine recording by andrew coleman
part ten of ancient greek philosopher scientists this is a LibraVox recording all LibraVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibraVox.org. recording by anchor ancient greek philosopher scientists a collection of their surviving words reported in ancient sources and translated by various translators part ten testimonials on zeno of elia translated by john burnett in early greek philosophy third edition aristotle metaphysics twenty one b four ten thousand one b seven if the unit is indivisible it will according to the proposition of zeno be nothing that which neither makes anything larger by its addition to it nor smaller by its subtraction from it is not he says a real thing at all for clearly what is real must be a magnitude and if it is a magnitude it is corporeal for that is corporeal which is in every dimension the other things that is surfaces and lines if added in one way will make things larger added in another they will produce no effect but the point and the unit cannot make things larger in any way simplicius commentary on aristotle's physics five hundred and sixty three seventeen if there is space it will be in something for all that is is in something and to be in something is to be in space this goes on ad infinitum therefore there is no space you cannot traverse an infinite number of points in a finite time you must traverse the half of any given distance before you traverse the whole and the half of that again before you can traverse it this goes on ad infinitum so that if the space is made up of points there are an infinite number in any given space and it cannot be traversed in a finite time the second is the famous puzzle of achilles and the tortoise achilles must first reach the place from which the tortoise started by that time the tortoise will have got on a little way achilles must then traverse that and still the tortoise will be ahead he is always coming nearer but he never makes up to it the third argument against the possibility of motion through a space made up of points is that on this hypothesis an arrow in any given moment of its flight must be at rest in some particular point aristotle observes quite rightly that this argument depends upon the assumption that time is made up of nows that is of indivisible instants aristotle physics nine two hundred and thirty nine b thirty three suppose three parallel rows of points in juxtaposition a b c one of these b is immovable while a and c opposite directions with equal velocity so as to come into the position b the movement of c to a will be double its movement relatively to b or in other words any given point in c has passed twice as many points in a as it has in b it cannot therefore be the case that an instant of time corresponds to the passage from one point to another simplicius commentary on aristotle's physics one hundred and forty thirty four but if we assume that the unit is something each one must have a certain magnitude and a certain thickness one part of it must be at a certain distance from another and the same may be said of what surpasses it in smallness for it too will have magnitude and something will surpass it in smallness it is all the same to say this once and to say it always for no such part of it will be the last nor will one thing be non-existent compared with another so if things are a many they must be both small and great so small as not to have any magnitude at all and so great as to be infinite if things are a many they are both great and small so great as to be of an infinite magnitude and so small as to have no magnitude at all that which has neither magnitude nor thickness nor bulk will not even be for he says if it be added to any other thing it will not make it any larger for nothing can gain in magnitude by the addition of what has no magnitude and thus it follows at once that what was added was nothing but if when this is taken away from another thing that thing is no less and again if when it is added to another thing that does not increase it is plain that what was added was nothing and what was taken away was nothing if things are a many they must be just as many as they are and neither more nor less now if they are as many as they are they will be finite in number but again if things are a many they will be infinite in number for there will always be other things between them and others again between these end of part ten recording by anchor end of ancient greek philosopher scientists